What is up, everybody? Happy Sunday to uh, all of you. I am very happy, although very, <laughs> very surprised to see a lot of the regulars here. Uh, I expected to see some new names. I do see one, AJ Muell. Happy to be here. Looking forward to the show. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much for dropping by. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rajak, as always, for all the introductions and the welcomes. Uh, Mr. Easy Go Lucky, thank you so much for being here. Jeff Wedding, I expected you, of course, but thank you very much. Uh, my wife, Vivian. Hi, honey. Good to see you. Uh, Rick, Derek, Marcus. Thank you so much, guys, for dropping in. Um, so I, I figured I'd be speaking actually mostly to um, vintage paperback uh, aficionados. Uh, and maybe I am, and they're just shy. They tend to be an older crowd and, and not so much into the uh, YouTube posting and whatnot. So... Who knows? Hopefully, uh, if you guys uh, into vintage paperbacks are, are, are watching, hopefully you'll take the time to uh, leave some comments and ask questions and what have you. Um, so, guys, I just wanted to say real quick that uh, uh, the reason I, I wanted to do this uh, is simply because uh, as a big fan of uh, not only vintage uh, paperback art, uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of artists who worked in that field, uh, Raymond Johnson being one of them. And um, a few months ago, I come to found out that uh, my friend, uh, the presenter of tonight's uh, uh, episode, uh, Lowell Wilson, uh, was working on not only a checklist for Raymond Johnson, but a, uh, he did a, a ton, a ton of research on the man's uh, life and career, um, which is fantastic because unlike comic book artists, most... Uh, most paperback, vintage paperback artists, there's really nothing known about them uh, other than maybe some of the credits they have. Uh, but typically their lives and careers are, are really not known about. Um, and because I, for a few years, had been working on my own Raymond Johnson checklist uh, for my own accord, uh, my own amusement, I uh, I thought, hey, you know, let me reach out to uh, Lowell and... Uh, decide to see if we can sort of uh, combine forces and uh, share the information that we each have uh, accumulated on the checklist and just to see how close we are to each other. Um, and it turned out we were very, very, very close to each other. Uh, we, we were in agreement pretty much on practically everything. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I helped him do this uh, because he, as you guys may have seen up um, here, and I'll show it again, he has just written um, a very extensive article on the career and work of Raymond Johnson, which has just been published in issue 77 of Illustration Magazine. And this has just hit stores. Um, so it is available now at uh, finer bookshops everywhere, including Bud Plant, uh, who all of you pretty much know, um, comic shops as well. Um, and like I said, yeah, anywhere that any most places that sell books. Um, every, every issue, uh, sells about 6,000 copies. Um, so it's very uh, widely read for such a small, um, you know, relatively small hobby. Um, and it's just fantastic. It's, it's every issue is typically 80 pages, glossy cardstock covers. It's a uh, perfect bound as otherwise known as square bound. So you can slide them right on your bookshelf. Once you're done, they're not floppy. Like we call it a magazine. It's called illustration magazine, but it's not a magazine in the, in the true sense of, you know, sports illustrator or what have you. It's not floppy. It's really stiff, and it's more like a, a an 80-page book every time you get an issue. And it's four times a year, so consider subscribing if you find this um, episode uh, interesting. Um, so with that being said, let me get that off the screen. And let me introduce you all to uh, my friend, Lowell Wilson, who is tonight's uh, presenter of the evening. Hey, Lowell. Hey there. Good to see you, man. Good to see you too, man. So, <laughs> so glad we could do this. It's... Uh, it's different from what I normally do, but like as you know, I love this stuff, and I've been I've been wanting to do a show on vintage paperbacks for a long time. So it just worked out perfectly the way that you you know you had been doing working this uh, this checklist and and biography, and and I said, geez, you know, I think we need to do a, a video version of this. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you agreed to do it, and it's it's been fun so far. So hopefully this show will be fun, you know. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I think anybody can see the enthusiasm in your face and in your voice. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a shout out. AJ Muller is Alan Muller. He's on the um, the that uh, one of the paperback groups, and he actually um, uh, did some editing for me oh. of the article. So I want to throw oh, him a shout fantastic. out. Fantastic. 
Um, Thank you, AJ. Yeah, I didn't see the R, so I just thought it was AJ Muell. Yeah. So AJ Muller. Okay, it is. Hey, Rick, how's it going? Marcus, Grace, Wilson. Super excited. Excellent. CRA. Grace is my daughter. <laughs> She's <tuning in. laughs> Hello. Yeah. She, she knows about my passion. I have I've filled our, our playroom with with this stuff, including yeah. including a Ray Johnson original right there. An original me. right there. Fantastic. I, I killed, killed Stalin, Stalin, for those of you who don't know. I killed <laughs> Stalin is the name of that painting. Uh, we'll, well get to that later. Later. <laughs> but we're getting a lot of new names coming into the chat, which is really fun. That's uh, that's what I was expecting. So Silent Not One and um, Bruce Brenner, of course. I, I you know, uh, uh, I myself don't know Bruce well at all. Um, and we may have emailed once or twice over the years that I've been in the hobby, but uh, Lowell certainly knows Bruce and, and he'll, I'm sure, say what he's, he's got to say about Bruce as well because he has been a tremendous help. So uh, believe me, Sila Not One, we, we have not forgotten about Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Bruce was a huge help. He was a, he was, uh, he's one of the instigators, I'll call him. <laughs> so fantastic. All right, so t t t let's, let's get right into this because we got a lot of vintage paperbacks to show people. And we still want to try to get it into a two-hour show or, 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 or less, um, if possible. So um, why don't you do it, start off by um, letting me know what was the impetus, the real impetus for you wanting to, because I know you were, you know, I know you loved the artist, Raymond Johnson, and I know you were already putting a checklist together, same as I was, but I was doing it for fun. What was the impetus to make you say, you know what, let me try to dig up info on a, on the life of a man who... Really, there was up until you came along to do this, there was nothing known about him. Nothing. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's been called the great mystery man of the paperbacks, right? Because he painted so many iconic covers. People know the art. They've seen it. And he's actually been credited a lot, I would say, over the last several years on um, on like Flickr and Pinterest. There have been a lot of quite a few people out there have recognized, hey, that this was Ray Johnson. You know, this is a Ray Johnson cover, and they've put them up there. Um, he was a pioneer of the good girl art, you know, which is the guys who painted good girls, meaning, you know, beautiful, sexy women. Yeah, um, so that's what sold a lot of stuff in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the Mad Men days, you know. Um, but, you know, some of the artists like McGuire and Bolarski, McGinnis, these guys were fairly well-known their lives because – for whatever reason, they were in the channels of collectors um, and people who were still alive at the time. Um, you know, Silent, not to Brian. So, hey, to Brian. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, so so people knew who Ray Johnson was. He painted these, you know, thick eyebrow women with these high pudgy cheekbones and just beautiful, yeah. you know, these incredible women, um, mostly on the Avons. Those see, I was an Avon collector. Um, right. so I know Bruce was as well. I started collecting back in the 1980s um, when when the Hanser price guides came out. I was right. a comic collector and I saw those price guides in the comic store and I started looking through and I was like, wow, these these books look like Golden Age comics, but they're yeah. cheap, they're only like five dollars. They're only yeah. ten dollars. And you yeah. see, guys, I, I got I got to say, you see, guys watching all you 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 comic art guys. There's actually potential for crossover here. You see, there's there's a lot of the guys that are in the vintage paper act started actually as comic collectors and then comic art collectors back in the 70s and 80s. And then for whatever reason, lost interest in the comics and stuck with the paperbacks, which is interesting, you know? Yeah, well, I think it's for like for me, it's kind of a maturing, you know what I mean? I mean, I still love comics, but, you know, the, the paperback books, hey, you know, when you actually learn the history of it, this was like the Internet revolution of the 1940s and 50s. Right. Um, we've talked about that in the past and we'll probably bring some of that up. But I just want to run quickly through, you know, the impetus. Um, obviously, you know, so I loved Ray Johnson covers, but I didn't really know that I loved them because I didn't know a lot of them were by him. Right. Except for a few of the Avons were credited on the inside. Enough of them for you to know, hey, there was a guy named Ray Johnson painting and a couple of them look like this. Then you could extrapolate to some of the other ones that, hey, you know. Yeah, these other ones are by this same guy, um, right. so that was helpful to have a few. But um, the real impetus is, you know, long story short, I sold my collection that I built in the '80s and '90s um, when I went out on my own. And you know, recently my daughter's gotten older; I've gotten more free time, 
and I started getting back into the paperbacks again. And um, on the CGC chat boards, uh, that's the comic grading oh, company. Oh, the CGC <laughs> chat boards. <laughs> the chat you gotta be board. careful. You gotta be careful mentioning that around here. The, yeah, a lot of, a lot, no, a I lot know. of us like guys, know. we're not big fans of that those boards, but okay. <laughs> no, I, I understand. But look, you know, it's funny because there's a small little cadre of vintage paperback collectors. Yeah, who, no, I know. They're really I know. pretty dedicated and they're all really good guys and no nonsense and just love the art form. Um, and uh, so that impetus really was veteran art collector, Doug Ellis. Um, he posted on comic art fans and then it got reposted on CGC, the original artwork for the metal monster. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Mark we have that here. Yeah. Okay. There we, so there we go. There you have it. So vintage paperback collectors have always known this cover, right? This is like a classic Abraham Merritt yep. science fiction cover. And when you look, I mean, the original on the left, you see how much brighter it is? It's something that's true about all of the original art, right? When you see the originals, you realize, hey, they got washed out a bit when they got published. Um, the vibrancy, the color, you know, just the, the composition, everything about it is, is just gorgeous and jumps off the page at you. But, you know, he put this up there and it was like, this is Ray Johnson. And yeah. a lot of us collectors were like, wow, he did those science fiction covers too. You know, we knew he had done some of the mysteries and uh, and, and a lot of the kind of romance good girl covers. But this was like a little bit of an eye opener because he did several of these um, merits and several other science fiction covers that have long been collected as classics. Right. The collectors. And so this is, this is so seeing... Seeing that being posted by Doug Ellis is pretty much the thing that made you go like, wow, like, all right, I I just I want to start digging into this guy's <laughs> career and life and because people don't know what it takes. Like, I think a lot of people don't realize what it takes, the amount of effort, the, 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 the laborious process that you have to go through just to, you know, to start from literally scratch where, you know, nothing other than the guy's name. Right. Right. And 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 big information up on, on somebody like that. I, I knew nothing about it until a few years ago, you know, when my friend Lynn Monroe started doing, you know, his same thing, what you're doing, right. His biographies and whatnot. And he told me all the work involved. And I was like, what? I, I, I admire you guys so much because I, I don't have the patience to, to, to do any of that stuff. You know, my, my forte is identification of, of styles in, in vintage paperback artists right like right. so i can i can I'm, I'm good at that that's that's where my strengths lie but i have no patience to go into the delve into the backgrounds and waiting for the census to come out on whatever decade <laughs> way back, you know so so yeah so you, you yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of work man yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's got their specialty but i'm going to give credit where it's due um i, I had some help it, i didn't just have his name so you know right away a bunch of people started saying Hey, well, who is this guy? Is this guy the pop artist Ray Johnson? Because if you Google the name Ray Johnson, you'll get 500 pages on a pop artist um, named Ray Johnson who did correspondence art. He did collages. He's relatively famous in the modern art scene. But, you know, I looked into him kind of quickly and, and I was like, no, this there's no way this guy didn't have the training to do realistic art like this, you know, and I'm not knocking the guy as an artist, he's a different kind of artist, but he was not a trained realist painter that you had to have been to do these covers, you know? So yeah. uh, one of the chat board guys, a guy named Pat Calhoun, who's a great, uh, he was a great contributor on those boards, really, really, uh, really widely knowledgeable. He reached out to David Saunders. Oh, the pulp, the great, great pulp, uh, not only aficionado, but historian and son of Norman Saunders, the wonderful pulp artist, the one of the yep, and paperback yes, cover no, artist, he did it all. And, and, did and it all. paperback cover artist, yeah. So David actually gave us a little sketch. He had figured out from because he knew him as a men's adventure magazine artist because he had done a bunch right. of Argosies. So David right. knew about the Argosies, and I guess he had looked up in the census because he said, "Yeah, this guy was born in 1915, and he did a bunch of Argosies, and he passed away in 1997." And that was so, about the extent of it. Um, and I, 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 I was going to say, should so so as you talk about this, 
Do you, do you think maybe do you want to show, first of all, some of the art? Like, um, well, well, you mentioned Argosy. We got a couple of Argosy pieces to show. But before we do that, just real quick, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put up that uh, slide of the earliest art that we kind of have of his from 19, I believe, 36. Correct. So he was right. born in 1915 in Chicago. Right. So this piece is from 1936 in February. He was about 20 years old when this came out. I mean, check that out. 20 years old and he's already that accomplished of a painter. I mean, yeah. that's that is insane. Yeah, I just ran into this randomly on eBay and I saw the oh. signature the, that Ray Johnson with yeah. the name Ray spelled out, which he only did that, you know, through, through the 40s and a little bit into the early 50s. And then he changed to just Johnson if he signed at all. So um, he was proud of this. I always kind of, you know, it's funny because I speculate a lot, right? And you say, well, you can't speculate too much. But in the absence of knowledge, sometimes you have to. And, you know, I'm thinking maybe he won a contest or something. Because I couldn't find anything else from the 30s. But, you know, as we've talked about, there yeah. was so much magazine and pulp and things back then. So little of it turns up online. You're kind of uh, stuck with what you see on eBay, what you see yeah. on certain repositories and people digging for this stuff. So it's impossible to know what other stuff he did. Oh, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But, you know, we're happy to have what we do have. At least it's something, right? Yep. And this is... So, uh, so, so you put up the soda jerk. That's Argosy, July 1946. Yeah, this is already 10 years after that first piece we just showed. Yeah. So in, betw in, in between there, I'm just going to take a, a, another minute just to acknowledge his, uh, his uh, war contribution. Like sure. so many guys um, of that age, he got called into duty in World War II. He fought in Italy. He was a, a squad leader and a sergeant. Um, he was in the um, 168th Infantry, the 34th Division of the 5th Army. And, you know, those were unsung units that went through the mountains of Italy fighting tooth and nail. Um, he, he probably saw a lot that he, uh, that he couldn't ever forget. Um, and he kept that with him the rest of his career because, you know, later on in life, after he finished this stuff, he spent his retirement painting, um, military outfits mm. and military unit histories, um, after he finished his commercial career. So that's partially what he was doing in that 10 year, um, hiatus between the two, uh, pieces of art that we're showing. Um, and the other thing that we do know is that he went to, uh, the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts before the war, which was um, that was it was like a practical school, not one of the salon schools, um, but it was fairly famous. Walt Disney went there. Bill Malden went there. Margaret Brundage went there. Wow. Um, some comic artists went there. Hal Foster, C.C. Beck, um, Gray Morrow, who I have <laughs> up on my wall. I really like Gray Morrow. Um, so he was classically trained in a in a in a fine arts school. Then he went to war, and then when he came back, just like quite a few of these illustrators, they wind they wound up in these men's magazines and then the paperbacks. So that cool. kind of brings us forward to 1946. Cool, and that brings us perfectly um, to another piece that he had done for Argosy, and that's from 48. Yeah, so this piece kind of uh, has a lot of what Johnson was about, right? You've got the beautiful girl, and you've got these rogues, and they're laughing and smirking. I always say, you know, these men's adventure magazines, some of them had crazy stuff, especially later. But Johnson always infused like a sense of humor into his art, even though he was painting rogues and, uh, you know, and, and women, you know, that were kind of wild yeah there's 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 a sense of humor there's a softness it, you know some of the men's adventure magazine guys just painted crazy oh <laughs> you yeah know, I, ray had a touch of class about him that was uh, that was very <laughs> yeah and then a couple of years after that although we we gotta assume because i'm gonna show something from 19 i believe 50 the, the true crime magazine but I mean, yeah. you got to figure it's not like he stopped working for a couple of years, right? You, it's it's just that there's only first of all, there's only so many things we can show. But at the same time, yeah. like we mentioned earlier, right? 
a lot of the stuff we, we don't even know. There's probably way more stuff that he's done we just don't even know about because the scans aren't out there. And unless we find them as we're trolling online, we just won't know and, until we slowly but surely one at a time. They, they start popping up, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and like the Argosies, he did at least 20 Argosies. You know, wow. he was steady there. Well, there you go. All right. So this, um, uh, one of my friends from the boards, Doug, um, showed me this uh, lineup detective. This is a true tr true crime magazine, and I didn't know at all that they did this. This is only a couple of months ago. Um, right. He found this and and showed it to me, and I was like, "Wow, he did some of this true crime." I mean, it's unmistakable. The girl's face, the the hair curled under, you know, um, yeah. that's just classic Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's as soon as you as soon, as soon as you showed it to me, I was like, "Oh, I mean." right away that's this is as clear as it gets that's a that's an easy johnson it is 100 johnson right off the bat like a, not even a, a, a fraction of a second's uh doubt on this yeah. one you know yeah so, beautiful hey, you know what cut to me for a second i'm just gonna yeah. do something unscripted so here's another one i found recently let me try to get it up there oh cool all true fact crime nice another one and you just picked yeah. that up wow which is obviously johnson you see the girl yeah and yeah for great. sure yeah, Absolutely. what's great about it, you see the photographer and the girl in the back. That's something we talked about. Johnson did a lot of paintings where he, like, has these characters way in the background, like, looking in. It's one yeah. of his things that he did. Yeah, sort of like Peeping Toms and sometimes actual Peeping Toms. Yep, yep. And that's what some of the literature was about. I mean, it was all kinds <laughs> of crazy stuff. All right, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, uh, before we we just just to let you all know, all the viewers know. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Um, this is indeed called the the vintage paperback art of Ray Johnson, <laughs> but we just wanted to give a, a little bit of a, a pre vintage paperback career uh, overview to let you guys see what other stuff he did. Be you know, well, not only before he got into the paperbacks, but during and 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 simultaneously. Um, so he did a couple of. Uh, Men's magazines here, real, real, the exciting magazine for men. You got to have to love the titles on some of these men's magazines. Yeah, this was the same publisher as Popular Library. And so if you see the right. date, 1952 is when he started painting for Popular Library. So he did some of their magazines. He did a few covers, mm -hmm. but only a few. And I think, you know, they gave him so many paperback covers to do. They probably figured they had other mouths to feed. They could give uh, some of these some of these covers to. But we'll revisit that bull a little bit later. Right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right let's check this one out because as a boxing fan um who was fortunate enough to to get into it because i saw uh muhammad ali in the last few years of his life uh on free television imagine that championship bouts on free television no pay-per-view i love, love this it. one love it just oh, great man. action. look at the action the expressions and i know Ruben, you love that texturing on the skin. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that's that's what I'm all about with Johnson. I mean, you know, as as, as everybody will will see as as the show goes on and we we start showing a lot more uh, of the covers, you'll you'll you know they're they're going to start seeing hopefully for themselves how, at a, you know at, at at a certain point he's doing a lot of very textured work, and then all of a sudden he he you know changes publisher and for that publisher he starts to do more blended painting and it's you know you got skin that's just really smoothed out um and you don't you know it's just smooth and slick and you don't really see any of the texture my favorite stuff is the stuff of course with the texture i'm all about the texture um but yeah i love this stuff and that's that's why i love this piece um and then another issue of real that he did the cover for we got this one and who doesn't love a good shark guys i was in, in previous episodes telling these guys i love dinosaurs who doesn't love a good dinosaur I feel the same thing about sharks. Who doesn't love a good shark? Yeah, well, you know, our good friend Bob Dice, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got this scan from his Men's Adventure magazine website. Um, I just want to throw a shout out if he's on there or if he uh, listens <laughs> to it afterwards. Um, I think he's actually did a book just on shark Men's Adventure magazine. There's there's a lot of sharks. <laughs> there's a lot of sharks. Did he, did he really, I know he's I know he's done he's done a lot of great books on, on men's adventure magazines, but did he really do one that's just about shark related stuff? Yeah, I think he's got one out that's that's just on shark. Wow. Okay. I'm gonna have to look into that. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's great. It shows a lot of versatility, you know. I mean, you can paint animals, paint, paint people for sure. Underwater scenes. Absolutely. 
Um, so, so why don't we take a look at, we'll, we'll stick, uh, we're almost to the paperbacks guys, but, um, we'll get, a, a two or three more pieces, a couple of pieces, uh, also from the men's adventure mags. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about these two? We'll start with this one. This is, these are two interior story illustrations. They're not covers. Let's check this one out. Yeah. So this is a great title, the shotgun husband of the long pig Amazons. <laughs> so, which is crazy, but you know, these men's magazines were filled with this stuff, and the long pig was human beings to the cannibals. They called, you know, men humans were the long pig and they would roast oh. them and eat them. Wow. So these stories always had like you know the hero adventurer, like you know, mixed up with, with cannibals in exotic islands. And in this one, of course, the women, you know, want to marry the guy and they're attacking him. Of it's course, classic Johnson, you know. It's it's crazy. It's uh, probably a little a little racist, but it's you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really well, it's, it's nineteen fifty nine. So I mean, people understand. I would hope you know it's oh, in the in the context of the times, right? Absolutely, yeah. it's in the context. All this stuff is. I mean, I I, I don't believe in in um, in uh, washing out any of this stuff because of its content. You do have to understand the context. Um, but he does. Show the humor again. You see the girls are laughing, and the guy is struggling, but he's not struggling too hard. I mean, he's he looks like he's really enjoying himself a little. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, oh, come on, you know, don't bother me. Stop bothering me. Yeah, you know? yeah. He's, not, he's not trying to fend them off too, too hard, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and he's and he's not just like torturing them or something. I mean, there, there's some of the later men's magazines were were pretty crazy and had yeah. all kinds of you know nutty stuff, but he was he was fairly tame for that stuff. For sure. Let's take a look at the last uh, men's adventure magazine piece that we have. And that's this one. Yeah. So this is December 1962. So as you could see, he was doing these things throughout his entire career. At the yeah. same time, he was doing paperbacks. I found about 80 pieces just peripherally while looking for paperback covers. Right. So, oh. so he, you know, who knows? A, lot. a whole lot more. But this one, again, it's, you know, it's got that sense of humor. The guy's laughing. You know, the girl, even though she's like, you know, 90% naked and she's got a kind of a mean look, but the guy being tossed off the boat in the back is screaming. It, it's still, yeah. it still has like a, that kind of a little bit of innocent humor to it, you know? Because yeah, though... he's got, he's kind of, he's got a bit of a goof, goof look on his face if you think yeah. about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> So you're kind of like, well, I don't know, is he struggling? He looks like he's drowning, but at the same time, not really. Like, I don't know, you know? Yeah, it, it's something that Johnson did a lot, you know, and and I, I think it's just, it, I don't know, you know, maybe it's because he had a he had a, 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 a fond heart for people. I, I, you know, the, the, you just get this feeling because it's infused in a lot of his stuff, even even his stuff that's relatively, you know, racy and crazy, you know? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Easy Go Lucky says, too bad it wasn't printed in color. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is that back in those days, uh, you know, for whatever reason, and it could have been just cost. It could have done come down, you know, simply to cost. Um, the Men's Adventure magazines, uh, they it was very common that they would print in what they called, uh, you know, monochromatic. So they would pick either one color, which this is not, obviously, or black and white. Um, and then occasionally in color, but they, they typically reserve the, the color for, you know, full color covers. Uh, and then the, the interior story illustrations in either black and white or monochromatic. But, that's, you know, that's just that's the way it was, you know. And uh, Marcus says, Fraulein Island. Isn't that awesome? That's a, <laughs> that's that's another thing that we love about the goofy, you know, the goofiness about the, the, the men's adventure magazines, you know, the craziness of the stories. And they would take like real life war things that happen at war and sort of really skew the stories far from reality, so to speak, you know? Well, and the audience was a lot of these guys who had come home from the war. They had lived through craziness, yeah. you know, and I think some of this was a release for them, you know, it was oh, sure. kind of uh, 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 a way to, to, to kind of spoof the, the horror, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so why don't we get now into the career of Raven Johnson when he gets into vintage paperbacks? Of course, at the time they weren't vintage; it was just the paperback market, which is which was a burgeoning, brand new way of delivering uh, literature. Because up until the nineteen forties, um, you know, obviously Lowell, you know, uh, yeah. but maybe the audience doesn't. 
all literature was put out as hardcover books, right? And it was, it's, which is, it's fascinating. You know, we talked about this earlier. I, 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 I never get tired of, of thinking about the idea that back in the forties or hell, even, even into the fifties, a hardcover novel would have set back, uh, would have set anyone back anywhere from like two fifty to $3 and 50 cents. And of course, by today's standards, you think, that's it. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, that makes sense. It was the 1950s. Cheap, right? Uh-uh. I like to I like to uh, give the 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 anecdote that you got to keep in mind that back in those days, the average person could have gone into their local diner, asked for a full breakfast of you know eggs, bacon, or sausage, uh, coffee, refills for free, uh, potatoes, home fries, and that whole meal would have cost them about 35 cents, yeah. right? So it's, suddenly you think about that and you're like, well, wait a second. I can either buy this novel I'd like to read for 350 or I can eat 10 times at that diner. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's crazy, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it, all of a it, sudden, these, these, these paperback uh, publishers started creeping up everywhere, left and right, delivering what used to be only available, honestly, to the upper middle class and wealthy individuals suddenly made literature affordable for the masses. And the books were what? 25 cents. Some, if they were thicker, 35 cents, you know, and, and suddenly everybody it. was reading, you know? Yeah. It really democratized knowledge. I mean, the paperback revolution, I, I say it unequivocally, it was the equivalent of the internet revolution of the nineties. I mean, you know, we can't put ourselves there. We didn't live it. But it's just like you said, you know, the the hardcover book, that 250, people were making 40 bucks a week. Yeah. So 250 was a lot to spend for a book. And the paperbacks came out and man, they were so successful. I mean, pocketbooks sold so many millions. I have pocketbooks from the 1940s where they um, would put how many were printed like total number of pocketbooks. Oh, right, right. By, by the mid How many million? The hundreds of millions. Right. You know, and yeah. the entire generation of men who went off to war, um, they got sent armed services editions, which is a whole separate little uh, production. But right. They came back to a world where for 25 cents, you could read about anything because it wasn't just literature. It was nonfiction too. You could oh, exactly. Read, Absolutely. You could read about dinosaurs. You could read yeah. about... Um, animals. There were the nature series. There's just yeah. everything. Everything. History. Everything, everything and anything. Those, Any, yeah. Books. Yeah, so, that's it. No. Classic, classic. Anything from classic literature, right? The most classic American literature you can find um, to the craziest fantasy, what have you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. So, so that that that's it. So let's uh let's let's go to some slides and all right, so sounds great. To work let's, with uh, at first. Okay, yeah, sounds good. We're gonna go uh, pretty much in order here, everyone, just so you all know. Um, for you viewers, especially uh, well, all of you, I mean those live viewers watching right now, but also those of you watching uh this on rewind, um, you should know that uh the way we're gonna show all the images is starting from now is uh, essentially in order that uh, Ray Johnson painted the paintings uh, so that you get a sense of the progression of his artwork, his art styles, and how they changed as, um, you know, the years went by and sometimes as he just changed publishers. So let's uh, show the first one, which was a, is a great example of early good girl art. There we yeah, go. Virtuous girl. Virtuous girl. So, you know, I Absolutely. point out in the article that this this painting and this cover was kind of revolutionary. Um, there had been good girl covers before by Avon and, and, and a few by some other publishers, but they were very cartoonish, very comic book-ish, I would call them. And this cover, um, is, this is about Johnson's third or fourth cover for Avon. His earlier ones were very small. They were like, dipping his toe in the water. But with this one, his style emerges virtually full blown, right? She's extraordinarily large. She takes up almost the entire cover. There's barely yeah. room for the title. That's about that, 70, yeah, three quarters of the cover much. for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, more than 75%. She's clearly not a virtuous girl, right? She's <laughs> she's dressed in this crazy outfit with her garters showing and her 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 uh, strap coming off of her shoulder, her breast yeah. prominent. She's got this incredible bouffant of hair curled yeah. under, which is something that he did um throughout his career. He, he always liked to paint with the with the hair with the curl um curled under. Compared to the other things that were on the stands, which we're going to show a quick example ah, of that, yeah, that's this was something movie. that was like extraordinarily <laughs> realistic and 3D. So here's three other covers that were on the stands in June 1948. Just to be clear, not by Raymond Johnson. Not by Raymond Johnson. Raymond no, Johnson I, I, broke this mold. I mean, not by himself, yeah. but he was certainly a pioneer. And that particular cover of Virtuous Girl was his first one where it was, you know, boom, here it is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to make a, a, a quick comment just for those who, who, who uh, vintage paperback collectors who may be watching and are familiar with some of these, these covers, particularly the Hucksters on the left. Uh, that cover is actually painted, drawn and painted by Bernie D'Andrea, um, who some of you may know as uh, one of the premier... Uh, uh, artists, illustrators who worked in the slicks, uh, the slicks being, of course, the the uh, the magazines of the the, the mid twentieth century. So it could have been anything from uh, Saturday Evening Post, uh, uh, gosh, uh, Red Book for women. Um, I mean, you name it. All those magazines that used to that used to be published, uh, both for men and women. I mean, all those you know they they had a they always came with uh, interior stories, and of course, they hired artists, illustrators to illustrate, you know, do spot illustrations for the stories. Um, and yeah, Bernie and Andrea ended up being one of the, the greatest ones of the mid twentieth century. And that uh, Huckster's cover is uh, is an early uh, paperback cover by him. So just an interesting little bit of a tidbit for uh, for those people out there. But um, okay, so once um, we go from that, let us come back to us. Um, he then does, sticking with the GGA good girl art theme, and you can tell. Take one last look, everybody, at, at, at the girl, and then see if you recognize that you can see that this would have been the same guy. Yeah, right. so this is for you comic guys out there. If you look on the right side, Intimate Confessions, number one, is one of the most valuable romance comics. Um. So this is Avon number 222, starting around 1949. Um, Ray Johnson basically became like a star at Avon. He did about a quarter of their covers um, from 49 through about 51. Um, and this one, The Neon Wilderness, is obviously a classic. It's it's one that I call a fridge magnet cover. Because right. if you look on the internet now, you find on Amazon, you'll find fridge magnets and postcards with this image because it's become so, you know, so famous. Uh, it's the red dress prostitute against the backdrop of Chicago, you know, some cheap gin joints and, and motels. The author, Nelson Algren, you know, he, he wrote stories about uh, drug addicts and drunks and just people on falling on the wrong side, on the, on the sleazy side of town, out in the neon wilderness, out, out in those neon signs. Um, yeah places where you go at night. And a couple of years later, Avon took this art and put it on the cover of Intimate Confessions. Um, I'll let you tell the story about the misattribution. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I just want to put it out there, guys, that uh, for any of you who still collect uh, comics, especially from this era, if you're if you're uh, familiar with, with Intimate Confessions number one that you see there on the right-hand side. Um, so, all right, how do, I, how do I put this? Okay, so up until, well, still, always and up until now, it's still ongoing now, um, that comic book, Intimate Confessions, um, if, you, if you find copies online, for instance, you'll see CGC copies, let's say. Uh, they, they, they sell for a pretty penny. On the label, CGC labels it as um, cover art, or in, sorry, interior and cover art by Everett Raymond Kinsler. And I just want you all, you comic guys, to know that 
especially for those of you who may have a copy. Um, the interior art, it's, it's pen and ink. The interior yeah. art in that comic book is indeed by Everett Raymond Kinsler. However, as you now know, by watching, having been watching this episode, uh, the cover is not by Everett Raymond Kinsler. It is indeed by Raymond Johnson. Um, and comic guys for decades have just been attributing it to Everett Raymond Kinsler for no reason other than the fact that they didn't know who did it since they had no credit for it. They figured since there's a credit for the interior art, they said, okay, I guess we'll just attribute the cover art as well to the same person. And and I, I guess they probably also did it because Everett Raymond Kinsler is a, a famous illustrator. And so it probably felt right to sort of, you know, give attribution to, to this famous illustrator. But no, it's, it's, it's uh, now and forevermore and has always been a Raymond Johnson cover. So if you have, especially if you have a, co a copy of that cover with, with the misattribution, because of course, if you have a copy by CGC, it is wrongly attributed. Uh, you might want to inform uh, CGC, Heritage, anybody who sells CGC comics. Uh, yeah. And tell them that, you know, it's by Raymond Johnson. And that's it. There you go. I got it successfully changed on the Grand Comics database. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. So we know, we know five books that he did. Um, you know, SLP Toy Avenue hey, says hello and uh, cl cl close enough, yeah, not quite. <laughs> hey, and they got the they got the they got the Raymond part right, Raymond part right, yeah, Raymond, but not Everett Raymond Kinsler. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kinsler did do covers for Avon later, but in his biography, um, he said definitively he didn't paint his first cover until 1954. So wow. that one, that yeah. one, Intimate Confessions number one, I believe, is 1951. Right. Three years before he ever painted a cover for Avon. There you go. All right, guys, let's look. We're going to go quickly because we're, we're, we're way behind on showing. If we really want to show everything we have, we're way behind. So we're going to go quickly. And I got to tell you guys, it's hard to go quickly through these because I want to stop on every one because they're so beautiful. But, okay, let's, let's just talk in generalities here. But let's give an example of a, a few more. Let's go with three, three more of uh, Johnson's good girl art type covers yeah these are his big big good girls in other words large figures yeah you know er, earlier on in the in the in the early 40s you didn't always see these large figures dominating the cover you know yeah same here so this is a stab um, at signet he did a couple for signet classic though you see that the hair curled under i mean he just did that yeah. kind of thing all the time and these guys the view from behind the guy, getting that camera angle to give it the three-dimensionality, right. something he did a lot. And I love this one. I just, I just you know, particularly because the, the woman is so just absolutely ravishing. It's just beautiful, you know, and then you got these sort of uh, slightly cartoonish, and they're realistic, <laughs> but cartoony at the same time, if you know what I mean, the, 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 the expressions, I guess, they're caricaturish is what I like to say. Well, it's the expressions. I mean, you know, obviously yeah, exactly. they're leering at her. You know, they're like these Madison Avenue executive types. Right. You know, and, and there she is. She's gorgeous. This was Jerome Weedman was a, was a million seller for Avon. And, uh, you know, Johnson got on quite a few covers of their million sellers, which is why he got so much work from them. Uh, yeah. Neon Wilderness was a million seller, too. So that was kind of a big thing um, for, for you to get uh, on the covers of these authors. All right, so let us go on to the next one, which is a very famous cover to vintage paperback collectors. Yeah. yeah. So this one has a lot going for it, right? Um, Johnson revisited this kind of looking through the bars motif a few times in his career, but it's kind of really effective the way, you know, so it, it's, if you read the blurb on the top, you're in, you're, you know, behind the, inside the walls of a mental hospital for women. So it's kind of like a, a mental hospital slash jail. And you're seeing behind the bars and you're seeing this hand with this greenish hue and a hypodermic going into her arm and she's yeah. cowering in fear. Is she yeah. mad? You know, it's like a question mark. Mad woman? You know, that's, that's always kind of like the question in these things, right? Who's running the madhouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I see, I love it primarily, personally, uh, primarily for the... Um, I mean, I'm a horror fan. I grew up a horror fan, but of course, uh, in 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 paperbacks uh, up until the '80s, really, maybe I guess maybe the '70s, you can say, 
there wasn't really the horror genre, right? There was suspense, that kind of stuff. And so this is this is the closest in these days, at least, you could get to like horror. So I love the whole, you know, suspense, the the, the terror, right? That 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 the character feels about what's about to happen, and the, of course the the suggestion of oh, it's you know, like like you say, it's, it's like a green tint that he used for the hand. So you're like, but it looks kind of alienish because of the green tint, you know, and, and it looks like the forefinger is, is it pointy? Because it gets dark and it's hard to tell, but it looks pointy. <laughs> you're like, is this some kind of creature, an alien or what's happening here? Right. Um, yeah. And then you've got the people that are really into collecting, um, you know, uh, vintage paperbacks that uh, had to do with drug paraphernalia and, and, and such. Um, and, and, and that's a whole other subset of vintage paperback collecting, but uh, like you said, it's got a lot of different things that, that go for it. You got again, good girl art, right? It's sexy, right? For this for this time, I mean, nineteen fifty, still, right? She's she's yep. captured, obviously, but like, why why is she necessarily got all that that cleavage so 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 exposed and down low? You know? Yeah, well, that was selling the book, <laughs> right? That's the Madison Avenue well, that's, guys. That's you know? it. But really, it's the composition on this one to me too, just all around. It's really, you know, it's it's really quite a composition. So I want to just address a good, good, good question, Stanley. Thank you. Um, so the the answer, the, the the simple answer to the question is no. It's well, yes and no, but mostly no. So there there are far, 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 far more uh, published paperbacks for which uh, the original paintings have never ever surfaced than there are published paperbacks for which the paintings have surfaced. So there are some, but yeah, it's, let's put it this way, uh, Stanley. Another way to put it is that compared to comic book art, uh, this stuff is much, 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 much rarer, much, much scarcer on the open market and, and in existence in general. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, you're going to see some of them. We're going to show a few. We showed one at the beginning, the metal monster, but for Johnson, we know of about 25 or 26 pieces of original art. And, you know, he did over 550 covers. <laughs> and Brian, Brian's copying to the fact that <laughs> all the missing paintings are in his garage. Nice. I believe it. Brian probably <laughs> has the most Johnson uh, uh, paperback art of anybody. Well, Brian, Brian <laughs> has a hell of a lot of art, uh, mid, mid 20th century American illustration in general. And he's got a, a killer collection and he shows a lot of it um on on comic art fans so you guys should check out his uh, his comic art fans gallery um and and it's listed as brian let me spell it last name you have you have to look up e m e r e r i c h so it's emmer and actually brian can tell me if he says it as emrich or emrick let me know um yeah but amazing collection and and you guys should definitely check that out yeah, his casting um, art is jaw dropping. I mean, he's got some iconic covers. Oh, it's sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize for that, Brian. I thought there was a um, an E before the 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 R. I'm sorry. So okay, one E. There you go. He did it for you guys. But check that out, guys. Look it up. First name Brian, and yeah, you're gonna love that. That what an amazing collection. If you like this type of art that you've seen so far, killer, killer stuff. So um, all right. So let us move on to the next one. The next. Johnson piece in our uh, selection this evening is a really cool and well-known to vintage paperback guys, uh, science fiction. He didn't do that many science fiction ones, but this one is very well-known and very cute. I love this one. Tell yes, us a little well, bit about another it. Another fridge magnet. <laughs> another fridge magnet, yeah. Another fridge magnet. I mean, it's so famous to, to, to paperback collectors. Everybody knows this. Anybody who collected Avon's, those round circle Avon periods, knows this cover, but, you know, it's just fairly, uh, fairly recently um, it's been widely attributed and it's obvious. You look at her hair, the curled under the shading. Um, it's, it's an obvious Johnson cover. It's so iconic, partly, you know, a, the, the, it's so colorful. It's classic science fiction, the giant alien ant, the buff hero stabbing it, you know, with his sword in the gut. And of course, yeah. the girl who's like a Cupid doll with these wings, and she's beautiful and 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 just looking out at the reader in horror. It's classic. Yeah, it's it's just great. And again, it's just it's 
when you th- when you think back to the time, the era, I mean, the middle of the you know 1950, right? Like it's it's it had to have really you know this hits the stands and and people must be like, whoa, look at that giant ant and yeah. oh that sexy woman, <laughs> you know, yeah. like what are they thinking, right? Like this is like whoa, like for us today, it's like whatever, but. Back then, it, it must have been just like, wow, look at that. Like, it's just mind blowing. It has to be in the 1950s. Yeah, well, it wasn't just the books. It was also, you know, in movies, there was a huge move towards science fiction and, and yep. horror and beam. Yeah, Marcus yep. B movies. There was yep. just a huge surge of this stuff. So there's there's quite a bit of it. And Johnson got a piece of it. He got a piece yeah. of the action. Yeah, check this one out. Uh, well, yeah, check this one out, guys. Another sci fi. Beautiful, love this. Look at the colors. Oh man, I mean, like the, the crazy flower creature, the flower, flower head monster, whatever you want to call. It. I mean, that's it's just nuts. What an imaginative design, you know? Yeah, and just another one. It's another fridge magnet. I mean, among vintage paperback collectors, this has always been like a grail book that you have to have in your collection, yeah. right? It's the green girl, and she's green, but she's still a Johnson girl with the thick eyebrows and the and the, 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 the high cheekbones and the hair curled under, you know, just, yeah. you know. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Thanks for dropping in, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Love that. And, of course, another example, you know, you could say sci-fi, which it is, but it's also, you know, it's for sci-fi collectors, science fiction. Of course, they, they, the older guys hate when I say sci-fi. They, they, they're, there's some hard, hard-ass guys who are like, no, 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 it's science fiction. I hate sci-fi. But anyways, uh. Yeah, no, they, 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 those guys collect these, these, this type of cover. And of course the good girl art, you know, collectors collect this, 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 this book as well, you know? And okay. So here's, let's get to this next one because of course it is the, the piece that I use for the promo for the show. Um, Musk, Hashish and Blood, another very famous Johnson cover. Yeah. Yet another fridge magnet slash postcard, (laughs) you know, again, this is, this is one that, I'm pretty sure uh, I posted this at some point on Facebook in one of the groups and Ed Hulse, who's a, a, a big um, paperback and pulp uh, history writer. He was like, yeah, that's one of those ones that every collector just has to have. Yep. And it's, it's, it's exotic. She's beautiful. She's framed in this, um, in this archway with the sinister guy coming in with the knife it's got intrigue. It's got drugs. Oh yeah, drugs. and and it's funny you say sinister, right? You you use the right word because you think about it. It's it's 1950, and it's got the sinister foreigner with the knife, right? It's ooh, it's this isn't just some local guy in, in in the New York alleyway who's gonna you know mug somebody, right? This is the the foreigner, like ooh, we we're scared of foreigners, right? So to put to put put to put this on on a cover, it's like back then it it was a big deal. Yeah, well, if you read the blurb, it's a modern man among the cruel men and passionate women of Algiers. Algiers, you know, yeah. it's like a foreign adventure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And but, uh, yeah, no, it's beautifully painted. But uh, it's it's yeah, it's beautiful and like you said, exotic. I mean, yeah, beautiful. I love this. I don't have a copy myself, but it's one that I've always wanted to get. Um, all right, so next is a really fun one, and I just wanted to show this one because. I just love, I love the typography, the color of it, um, you know, the style of it in combination. It just seems to fit the art as well. You know, the crazy parrot, which of course is part of the title. Um, the fact that it's another good girl art cover. I'm just like, you're just wondering what, what the hell is going on here? A Chinese parrot. What the hell is a Chinese parrot? Why is there a parrot there? Why is she, why is she so low cleavage? Why is there a guy flashing a, uh, a flashlight onto her is she scared of the guy with the flashlight or is she kind of scared of the parrot like i don't know what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cinematic right because again it's that angle of how you're looking in and the guy you're almost if you look in the lower corner you're almost looking into a window but there's a guy inside the place who's shining the flashlight on her and cj yeah the hair again yeah curled under hair yeah this, this has been um featured in one or two of the early vintage paperback um, history books. And right. everybody just loves that giant parrot. It's just cool. Yeah. 
All right. So we got, uh, if we want to make our uh, self imposed limit, uh, we got about uh, at least over a minute per cover to show here. Yeah. So let's, we'll be good. Yeah. We'll, we'll be okay. Well, let's move through a few of these. One of his rare Westerns. He never did that many Westerns, right? But it's cool. And of course, as you can see, everyone take a note. It is a Western, yes, but he made a very pur purposeful effort to show that, hey, Calam Cal uh, Calamity Jane of Deadwood Gulch is uh, a fine fox as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't see the foxy uh, low-cut uh, shirts on, on we in Westerns uh, too often, you know? Uh, not, not, not even back in the days in, in, in the same time period, uh, if you looked at Western television shows, of course, or, or uh, uh, movies, you know, it, it, everybody was pretty well covered up, but this is, uh, yeah, pretty risque for the time. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just classic Johnson girl again. She's got the hat on, but she's got the thick eyebrows, the, the, yeah, the puffy cheeks. rosy cheeks. Yep. And, and I'll just point out quickly, cause I love pointing this out. He only did a few Westerns, but he drew horses. Like, I love how he drew horses. I call it cute horses he didn't draw them as like these kind of sweaty muscular beasts he kind of just had this this look on them that made them very um it was almost like anthropomorphic yeah. You know? yeah 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 pretty pretty cool all right guys this next one check this one out this is really fun because again it shows the the range the absolute range in uh in technique and style that johnson had and you check out the subject matter and you think oh okay it's they probably told him that he had to kind of do that style because of the subject matter. Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, again, like you kind of said earlier, right? You can say uh, the racist because of the caricaturish nature of the African-American, right? But it's just beautifully done. I mean, it's just the, the, the color palette, you know, the, the caricature, uh, the ability for him to do caricature. It's just phenomenal. It's just absolutely beautiful. I love this cover. Yeah, well, Cla first of all, Claude McKay was uh, was a was a quite a noted African American author. So, you know, this this was going through the proper channels at the time, and I think one of the um, one of one of the, the cool things about it is it's yeah, it's caricaturist, but you know, he's showing a wide range. He's not just showing, um, you know, uh, some uh, single unit right of the culture right. he's showing these rich guys on on and his wife on the left side and then these kind of dressed up dandies on the right side and then these guys fighting and then that clownish guy in the front with right. that greenish hue and you know but what really makes it work is like the action the the characters are all over the page and you have that exaggerated high elevated train line going up over the back um you know, it's 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 a it's just yeah, the story. It's so beautiful in, in person when you see a copy of this book because of the coloring. Um, and he came out of a cartoon background, so that cartoonish look on the faces is something that he would have been well versed. Um, I didn't touch on it earlier when we ran through his life, but before the war, um, he was an animated cartoonist for Paramount Pictures, who did Popeye and Betty Boop. And so you can see a little bit of that kind of, it almost looks like a little bit of an of a painted in animation cell kind of figures, you know? And and um, and just I just I just want to plug um uh, everybody in case for those of you who came in late. Um what we're doing here, uh Lowell and I is is actually just an extension of a very in-depth article that Lowell wrote. Uh, here, let me show you. This is what the cover to the magazine looks like. It's called Illustration. Um, and this one just came out. And this can be ordered, by the way, um, by uh, local comic shops. So for those of you uh, who are comic guys, um, if you ever want to get this to read and get all the details of the man's life and, and his career, uh, all in much more detail than, of course, than, you know, Lowell has time to tell you now. Um, yeah, this is issue 77. So um, ask ask the local comic shop or, or, or magazine or bookshop um, to order you a copy. Um, yeah, and I'll, yeah, I'll just add quickly, Ruben. Um, yeah. From the Illustrated Press, you can also order it digitally, and it's a lot cheaper ah. if you don't want the glossy. It's a beautiful glossy. It's almost like a coffee table book, the magazine, yeah. you know. But um, if you want to just, you know, check it out and, and don't have the funds, I think it's only $5. For a digital yep. copy right perfect all right let us move on to the next one and this is more of the kind of a crime noir genre 
My favorite, by the way, if anybody wants to know. And you want to send me a free painting? <laughs> you mean the genre, not particularly this painting, although I know you like this painting too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, cool. I, I I love this. I, I I love the composition more than anything. I mean, of course, I love that she's sexy and she's got she's, you know, again, here we go with the you know, low cut, beautiful, fashionable dress. Um, I love the whole thing, you know, the idea of the the first person point of view, right? Where you know, he puts you as you're, you're the guy, you're, you know, the viewer, the guy holding the per anybody who buys this uh, or looks at this is, is the person whose handcuffs, uh, whose hands are handcuffed, you know? Um, and she's sort of looking. And the only thing you don't know is, is, you know, she's looking at the handcuffs. Why is she all scared about it? Right. Is she really looking at the handcuffs or is she looking past the handcuffs and there's something up with the guy's face? And maybe that's what's what's really going on here. We don't know, right? That's why you got to read the book. Yep. <laughs> Diagnosis homicide. Someone's dying. So, yeah, yeah. It's just a great angle and a little unusual for him. Very cool, though. And camera's behind. Yeah, exactly. And, hey, Stevie B, good to see you, man. No, James on Ronda Johnson. I am not familiar with his work, probably because most of the books I have read uh, have pictures in, in them. <laughs> Comic guy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, Stevie. And uh, yeah, bondage for male. Does it count when it's male? I don't know. Uh, I think they, in comic books, I think they call them bondage covers, whether they're male or female. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And here we go to another classic. And I go, and again, we go back to that familiar theme, a theme that we saw uh, with Musk, uh, Hashish, and Blood of the scary foreigners. Ooh, in 1952. Maharaja. Maharaja. This is so beautiful. Yeah. So this is an original painting on the left. You can see. Yeah. Original art on the left, guys. Yeah. So this is one of the few original ones surviving. Obviously, um, Dan from Illustration put this on the cover uh, largely because this was uh, Johnson's first painting for a popular library. Um, it corresponds with the time when he moved from Chicago to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, where he shortly after uh, got married um, at the age of, I think he was 37 or 38. Um, so he he lived in his with with his parents' house basically until he was in his late 30s. Um, partly due to you know being raised during the depression, um, you know it was common. I know it was it was my own father's experience of of you know staying at home and working and to, to help the family, um, but. Obviously, he did a beautiful job painting that painting. Lots of gorgeous color. Um, yeah, and look at look at the look at the. This is one thing that that you know the the comic art guys may not probably are not familiar with, but oftentimes when when um, the paintings survive, those that did often they were damaged, like yeah. like because they didn't take care of them. They you know just just like you know back in the days where they they would throw the comic art back into a uh, some some utility closet. Uh, in stacks, uh, they pretty much did the same thing with paintings. But of course, bristleboard it, it doesn't get quite damaged as easily as you know uh, illustration board with paint on it. And this stuff would get stacked on top of each other. They would sort of move it around by like pulling on it, dragging it. The paint would you know one would drag against the other. And so a lot of these paintings are did not you know the ones that survived. A lot of them didn't survive in great condition. They're like all scratched up and, and just have all, all sorts of various damage. But look at this one. It is absolutely stunning like that it survived in that phenomenal condition, like it was painted yesterday. Yeah, and the colors are just vibrant. He used a lot of colors. And, of course, the yeah. classic, the guy, you know, the look on his face, he's obviously checking out this Indian beauty, you know, he's, uh, while he's eating some grapes. Tough life for the Maharaja, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he 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 had it he had it tough. So uh, AJ says, love the extra detail that comes out in the actual. Yeah, well, exactly, AJ. I mean, believe me when I tell you, I would love nothing more than to have been able to 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 show every single image as an original painting. That's what I normally would do. Um, and and in fact, that's what my whole channel is about. Although primarily about comic book art, but that's what it's about. It's about the original art, not not you know not the published versions, but. Um, because so little of the stuff, you know, typically survived. Um, yeah, we, we, we show the original art, you know, I'm showing the original art as much as we can. Uh, there's just not all, a, a lot of it. So for most of the slides, I have to show only 
the um, the published book covers uh, as well as a um, a blow up uh, of the cover next to it. You know, um, so Kamagar Boston. So he says, what kind of restoration is acceptable? Look, to be honest, um, what you you what you want to do is, I mean, it's pretty much all acceptable. Um, it, it, it's it's not really. I would say, I would say it's not really much different than the, the, with comic book art uh in the sense that you you look people want to preserve the stuff they feel like wow it, it managed to survive and especially with the with the vintage paperbacks it's so much more rare than even the 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 comic book art that when they see something damaged a painting that's been damaged they're far more willing to get a restorer to do infill painting um, so, you know, scratches that are deep scratches where, you know, the paint's gone. Um, yeah, it, and that it's accepted. It, it's, it's, it's definitely accepted. I've seen many paintings and there's one actually coming up very, very soon. I'll, 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 we'll talk about, um, that were submerged in water, probably through flooding in a, in a, in a basement, something like that. Uh, people have managed to rescue those paintings and, and they look like they never were submerged. So it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, so I, I think, I think pretty much anything goes, um, within reason, you know, like, like comic art, like, yeah, w within reason. But if you have anything, uh, comic art Boston, uh, specific that you're thinking about in mind, ask me, um, because, you know, I, I don't know if you're, if you're thinking, you know, whether replacing a huge chunk of a painting that was missing, if that was valid, that I don't know. And I've seen paintings with chunks missing that have not been restored probably though, because it would be too costly and possibly not even nobody's able to, to, to fix it well enough. So, um, so, but thank you for the question. Um, it's good. It's good for people to know. So let's move on to this next, the GGA cover the forsaken with a peeping Tom in the back. Yeah. Just another beautiful popular library. I mean, he, you could tell he took a lot of care on these early ones. Um, you know, you know, possibly, Probably this is a new publisher and he really, you know, he really just made this painting glow. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And AJ said, Doug Ellis had had some great restoration work done on some of the paintings he owns. Yes. And AJ, he also has had some done um, on, on pieces where I just know because of the amount of work in, in, they entailed. Uh, it was really, really costly, but you know, Doug, Doug is very much, uh, uh, not only a connoisseur, but, um, you know, he, he, he wants to preserve the art for future generations. And so he, he has been known to spend, you know, ridiculous amounts, um, that, that may not be worth it to most people. Um, but just because he cares about the art so much and to put it back into, to, you know, um, the, it's proper state and look who popped in. The famous Gary Levisi, everybody, um, for those of you, uh, the comic art guys uh, uh, who are watching, uh, Gary Levisi is a longtime vintage paperback aficionado, um, historian, writer, has written tons of books about paperback collecting, as well as novels of his own. Um, and he says, thanks for such a wonderful view of these classic books and cover paintings. The shame is that sometimes artists threw away these paintings. That's true. Uh, so we should be thankful for what has been saved. Absolutely. Absolutely, Gary. And thank you for coming by. Um, I was going to give you a plug near the end of the show, by the way, Gary. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, guys, Gary has his own um, uh, YouTube channel. And it is also like like myself, Ruben the Collector. He goes by his name. His channel can be found as Gary Lavisi. Uh, so just check that out. And he has uh, uh, tons of, of videos. He, at this point, he's probably into the hundreds. Um, far briefer than mine, of course. Um, and, and he, he, he talks all about the history of, uh, uh, vintage paperbacks. So, uh, check that out when you have a chance. Um, so, all right. So let us move on to the next one. Another good girl, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, oh my God. And this one, of course, uh, very happy to see that we, uh, we have another one with the original art that survived. And again, in absolutely beautiful condition. I mean, look at that on the left. I mean, I, it, you would, you really would think like somebody might have recreated it, you know. I mean, it's it's that fresh. The paint is as fresh as it was when the you know from the day that it that it it first dried. Um, yeah, fabulous. The 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 art style. It's got that. It's it's that style where he's not using the the texture. He's going more for that slick, 
um, slicker blended paint style on the skin. Um, the beautiful lighting though. It's fantastic. I mean, look at the original, how much it, 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 sorry, the, the, uh, the published version on the right, how it pales. It absolutely pales in comparison to the original art. Right. I mean, uh, and, and for that reason alone, it's so wonderful to see that the, the original survives because, you know, you look at the copy of the paperback or the, the, in this case, it's called the digest. You look at a copy of that and you're like, oh yeah, really cool, beautiful cover. And you think, oh yeah, this is a great cover. But until you see the original, you don't realize, wow, how much was lost in the, in the printing of it back then. Yeah. The printing kind of dulls it out and it kind of, it, it, it kind of, uh, you're welcome, it, it Gary. blends out a little bit of the, uh, of the sharpness of the detail besides, yeah. as you've mentioned before, them sticking the title right over the guy's head, which kind of upsets the, the composition. A bit. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. It doesn't work with the, with the, yeah, the typography doesn't work. That's kind of stupid, but clearly they wanted you to make sure that you saw the woman. Right. So. Yeah, but I'll um, tell you, good luck finding a copy of that digest. It's got to major. Really tough to find his phantoms. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Very rare. And, um, yeah, you you take take this because you you, you want to say something about this one, uh, Lowell. CJ says, where did Raymond Johnson primarily reside? Chicago. He resided in Chicago up until 1952. From 1915, when he was born, obviously he went away from the war. Um, so he was in Chicago until until 52. Uh, when he moved to Kalamazoo, he got married in 1953, and then in 1959 he moved to New York to Astoria, Queens which is where he lived um, until he passed away in 97. And perfect timing for this one, Lowell, I think, right? I mean, 1959, yeah. right? And he moved to a story in New York, and that's that's Ray right there with his wife, Labonia. Yeah, um, this is a rare picture of Ray. We've only uncovered a few of them. Yeah. Um, you know, he wasn't a big guy. I think his, his draft card said he was 5'6", weighed about 150 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know, it's commonly known among the war guys that a lot of little guys won that war. <laughs> that's right that's exactly it well guys next we have up a beautiful one that some of you may have seen on comic art fans because our friend brian um owns this one and i adore 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 the composition I, everything about this one it's so alive i mean it just five characters they it just the whole scene is just alive um i, I don't even have the colors everything about it, everything the composition the colors um it's 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 um it's one from avon so it's got the 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 style my favorite style of all the different styles that uh johnson employed i mean this is this is my favorite um yeah i'm so happy that this survived um and so so amazing that that brian ended up getting getting it and putting it into his collection but uh beautiful composition especially i mean to me composition is everything um, and this one has it all. I mean, it just, it tells a story right in one picture. Yeah. I mean, this, it, this is, you know, I've heard some people refer to this as it's painted in the Renaissance style, right? It's kind of old masterly, you know, it's really just has those highlights. Very much so. Yeah. Glowing, uh, characteristic to the characters like a Rembrandt, you know, just beautiful. And as you said, the composition, look at the girl's hand, the way she's pulling her hair back from her neck. Very few artists on a paperback who were getting paid probably two hundred bucks to do this painting. Yeah, put that much you know detail and and care into a painting. It's just it's just a great piece of work. Yep, and uh, just to just to answer SLP Toy Avenue, um, yes, exactly. On the previous one, Robert O. Saber is the author. Um, yeah, it's always the author whose name you'll see on the covers. Yep. Um, yeah. The artists were very rarely credited. Occasionally they were signed. This original painting is signed, but as you can see, it's kind of crushed yeah. over in the corner. Most of them that were signed, the uh, the uh, um, the publishers cut the signature off. And uh, yes, it is, Mr. Easy Go Lucky. And Marcus says, Louis Scott thought his wife was window shopping for their anniversary. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... Yeah, no, that's a, that's a beautiful one. And and um, SLP Toy Avenue, um, you know, just to let you know, um, to, 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 you know, sort of expand a little bit on that question, not only, is, you know, would the, the books only credit the, the author on the cover, but many of the publishers actually went out of their way 
to hide the name. For example, if the painting was signed by the artist, the publisher would go out of their way to hide the signature, either by carefully cropping the image so that the signature would not show, or even to the extent that they, they would get somebody, you know, whether it was the art director or whoever, anybody in the office, they would get them to paint over and just cover the signature. And the reason they did that was because in those days, because the, the, the paperbacks business, it was such a, a, a tremendously high growth business at the time. There was so much competition with, with new publishers popping up like practically every day. So there was a lot of competition and especially for the best painters, right? The best artists. So these publishers, once they latched onto a, a great artist whose covers sold their books really well, they didn't want to risk losing these guys. And so that's why they were scared that if their competition saw their signature, that they'd be able to figure out, okay, let's find out. We'll, we'll find out who this Johnson guy is and we'll pay him a little extra and he'll come and work for us instead, you know? So the way that these guys were treated was horrible. If you think comic book guys were treated bad, and they were uh, back in those days, um, the vintage paperback uh, guys were like, even worse. So, all right. So let's move on to the next one because we definitely are falling behind, my friend. Yeah, let's kick it up. We'll kick it up a little bit. So this is another example of, um, well, it's interesting because I call this good girl art because she is a, a sexy uh, a girl. Um, and of course the, the title tempting tigress, you know, but, uh, it may be more of, a I don't know. Is it one of those, um, a crime? It, it, the guy looks kind of like a detective crime type from that era. You know, well, I don't know. As G Gary, Gary, would call these the, the sexy digest. They were uh, yeah, they are. Yeah. Well, they are known that way. Right. It's it, they're, yeah, they're, they're kind of like romances. They're really romance. They might have some element of crime and, and other stuff, but they're, yeah. they're breezy reading. For for yeah. the train with uh with with a really nice painting though done for the cover. Yeah, um, yeah. And 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 just like this one, check this one out. So there's another yeah. digest, what they call digest, you know, good girl art, um, sexy. And of course, uh, the left hand side guys is uh the original artwork. That's not just the blow up uh with the typography missing, it's the artwork. Another one that again, beautiful condition. It's thank God it survived the way it did. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So it's such a thrill to see that. Um, the colors are spectacular and, uh, yeah. I mean, what else do you say? Is this another good example of, of, you know, the type of stuff that he did on these sexy type digests, yeah, uh, which color. kind of a, an interesting segue. Cause we move away. Well, it's interesting. Cause here we go with this one. Check this one out guys. And this is the one that, um, hold on. I'll take this off. Uh, so everybody take a look behind Lowell in the background one more time. I know it's a bit far away, but you see what is a, um, soldier, um, looking like he's whipping a sexy, a scantily clad woman, um, except you don't see the whip. All right. So that is a, from a book called I Killed Stalin. Very famous cover. Um, the, obviously the, the original art survived. It's right there in, in Lowell's collection, beautiful condition again, gorgeous colors, Another, you know, example of the, the sexy female. Um, but here's the thing I wanted to ask you, Lowell. On this particular cover, since he was whipping her, yep. why, why do we know why the, the whip was ultimately painted out after this publication? So I, you can only speculate, really. I mean, it's right. obvious by, and I can't show it on the camera here because you can't see it, but in person, he is he's holding a whip in his hand hey, Mackie, boo -boo. up around his up around behind his head and um and also her shoulder her left shoulder that little bit of strap was added later you can tell there's just a big blob of paint so this was released in early 1952 which was right around the same time as um there were a lot of congressional hearings into both comic books and books and magazines right about um mostly about the content but also right. partially about the artwork of it being considered obscene and it's going to corrupt the youth and yeah and, the guy, and, 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 and everybody time. watching I, I think most people at least a lot of a large percentage of the guys watching know because a lot of us know whether we're in paperbacks comics or both 
about the whole seduction of the innocent, right? And the Thomas Code Authority, Estes Kafaver hearings, and all that, right? And that's yeah, it, it involved more than just comics. It, it, it involved vintage these this vintage paperbacks as well, and 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 magazines and what have you. Yeah, so the congressional hearings were started right in the beginning of 1952. So I suspect yep, we're that they clean this one up to 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 even though it's still a little crazy, right? It's a KGB yep. agent like whipping this American woman, yeah, um, uh, or you know, and then now maybe just beating her. And she's uh, a U. She's a she's supposedly a U.S. secret agent. Yeah, yeah, I believe that's I believe that's what it's supposed to be shown. Um, <laughs> And you know, of course, during the Red Scare time, um, it's uh, it, it was a huge seller. It's a huge seller. I'm pretty sure this yeah. was a million seller for Sterling Noel. Um, but yeah, just a, just incredible detail. And that painting is on stretched canvas, and it's very large, which is unusual. Right. And he, he put a lot of work into it. Yeah, gotta say that to everybody um, again, just for the purposes of uh, uh, being more educational about this stuff. The vast majority of the work done for vintage paperback covers um, was done on standard brain uh, Bainbridge type illustration boards. Um, but every now and then don't ask why, because it could be for multiple reasons. It could have, the artist could have run out of, of illustration boards simply, but he had a, a canvas lying around that they would use to, you know, paint on their own, you know, for their own um, amusement. Um, and yeah, and they would occasionally use a, a stretched canvas, but most of the time you'll find these on a one eighth, uh, one eighth inch thick uh, illustration boards. All right, let us well, let's get through some more originals. Yeah, let's go. Here's another original, and this one I, I, I alluded to earlier. This is a piece that had originally been offered to me. Um, I believe it was several years ago, so I believe it was by All Star Auctions. It was uh, Joe and Nadia Manorino. Um, at All Star Auctions, and I passed on it. And the reason was because this one, I couldn't get it. Like they didn't have a great photo of it. From the best I could tell, it did appear to be waterlogged. It seemed to have been at some point been caught up in a flood somehow. And I just, I was like, you know, I here in Canada, we don't have the easy access to restorers and conservators that you guys do over there. And because of that, I would have to use an American restorer conservator. And it's just more of a hassle for me because I've got to send the painting out through the border. And then when they finish doing the work, they got to send it back to me back through the border. And then customs thinks, Oh, this is something that I'm buying. What's this worth? And then they want to make me pay sales tax on it. Cause I'm importing it. You know what I mean? And it's just a big hassle. And that's why when, when paintings that I find that I want, when they're damaged, I just, I just, I have to leave them and I, I leave them for, for an American collector or, you know, somebody who has easier access to the uh, to, to, to conservatory uh, uh, experts. Um, and that's it. But somebody ultimately bought it and they did get it uh, worked on and it looks absolutely fantastic now. So, um, yeah. yeah, beautiful, rich colors. It's got that just that, that typical gorgeous uh, uh, Johnson girl, um, the, the, the typical color palette that he often used at this time period with a popular giant. Um, the, 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 the sleazy sort of leering guy in the background. Um, yeah, this is just, yeah, it's, it's just classic early fifties, uh, uh, Raymond Johnson. Um, and here's, here's for you guys to show another popular library. Let me show you this one. Another sort of scantily clad, low cut dress example from again, popular giant, similar lighting techniques that he used with, uh, uh, for most of his covers at Popular Library uh, from the same time period, of course, 1953. Another sort of peeping Tom through the window, but this time in the foreground, which is, you know, the opposite of what, what he usually did. Right. But he did do a lot of these where he kind of used the camera angle from and showed the backs of people's heads to give three-dimensionality like that. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 again, it's the, the POV puts you right there kind of thing, right? Yeah. And SLP says, full circle, that painting would get you canceled today. <laughs> exactly. Another banger. She looks like she gives a zero fucks. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Let's check out the next one. All right. So this is uh, interesting because you know what, Lowell? This is the class. When I see this, right yep. away, the first thing I think of is Avadi. 
right? James Avati, for those of you who don't know, one of, the, again, one of the most preeminent, one of the all-time best vintage paperback artists. Um, there's a book on him. It's out of print, unfortunately. But uh, if you can find a copy, yeah, fantastic, fantastic book uh, with also very in-depth um, uh, information on his life and career. Um, but it, it reminds me of him because Avadi was known for being a guy, for whatever reason, who was always seemed to be assigned to this type of cover. He did so many of these, what I call, backwoods covers. <laughs> yeah, it was a whole type of fiction, this kind of backwoods fiction. Um, you know, there was obviously there were a few big, uh, big sellers like Erskine Caldwell. Um, and, and, and oh, yeah, Erskine Caldwell, that's the most famous, exactly. Yeah, so this is this kind of became known, it's like backwoods slash swamp fiction, lots of scenes of like hay CD kind of people on front porches. So, this is 1953 after Avadi had already kind of become famous for doing that. So, it yeah. was likely that the Venus Books ed ed editors said, Hey, <laughs> make this one like Avadi, and uh, and he applied. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's 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 really is its own sort of genre, right? The backwoods girl genre, if you if there's you will. tons of them. They're, yeah, they're, tons they're, of them. They're great. They're really really cool. All right. So this is a beautiful one. And again, uh, we don't really have time to, to keep stopping on them. We still have way to go, a long ways to go. But just look, guys. Look at the colors. Look at how he sold. I mean, the water, right? The ripples in the water, right? Her body beneath the surface. Yep. I mean, he sold it. It looks like you could dip your hand into it. Like that's actual water, the beautiful green tint. It's fantastic. I just love, love, love this. Um, yeah, you know, he, he wasn't a photorealist, but he was no. he, he was a realist. And he certainly he, with the lighting, is, certainly, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, here's another one again with popular library, similar type color palette and lighting techniques. Another beautiful woman um yeah i mean and and uh, who doesn't love a redhead i know some people don't i love redheads <laughs> i've got I've, I've got a couple of original paintings on my walls that are redheads so um and here's yeah, here beautiful here. cover beautiful yeah check, simple but beautiful check this um this next one oh yeah this 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 is the crazy guy so he's painted this guy was a model for him for for quite a few covers but yeah, kind of like Mad Woman. This is a little different. This is Ward Twenty. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about this, so you, you'd have to tell me about that. I mean, I, well, I don't know. I don't know about the actual novel. Okay. But it's a very striking cover because of the whites, the way they blast up out of that background, and and the, the way that they're looking at you is a bit more direct than you usually see on these covers. Oh, no, exactly. And um, I'll get to Kamagar Boston's, uh, your, your question in a moment, um, uh, Kamagar Boston. I do want to say what I love about it, and I'm, I'm on because I'm all about draftsmanship, right? It doesn't matter in, in illustration, uh, whether it's comic books, or vintage paperbacks, whatever. Look at the hands, guys. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> look, at, look at the Come on, dude. Look at the hands. To me, that's the best part of the paintings. They speak volumes. The hands speak way more than even that guy's face does or hers uh, or their body language. I mean, that, that the hands, man. Look at the hands. They're just, ah, it's, it's fantastic. Master masterfully painted. Yeah. Masterful, masterful, masterful. Love that, love that. Um, and um, let me go again here to pop it on the screen. So come on, Boston says, so what is the estimate of how many paintings he did? Ah, excellent. And over how many years? And apologies if the information was already given and you were late. No, no, no. And I'm glad you asked. That's, that's the kind of questions we love to, to have to educate the audience. So go uh, you go ahead and take that one, Lowell. Yeah, I mean, I might have mentioned earlier, but it, it, it was 500. We've, Brian, you pig. <laughs> we've, we've uncovered uh, on our checklist, it's over 550. I think we're up to about 570. Um, he paint, his first cover was for Avon in 1946. He only did a few, but he started in earnest around 49, painting a lot. Um, and his last one was about 65, 1965. But he did very few um, after about 1962, because that's when he ended his run at Monarch, which was like his last kind of big gig. 
Right. So, so you know, we're still finding new ones. You know, uh, Ruben and I have talked about this. We think we've got the vast majority. We're up to about 570, but that includes ones where they reuse the cover because we include them, you know, as a separate cover if it was another printing. Um, so there's probably 20 or 30 at least that were reused. Yeah. But, um, but at least 550. Mm -hmm. um, but we found a few more uh, just recently. Yep. I think I even have one I haven't shown Ruben yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and just, just so you guys know, and in particular to you, Comic Art Boston, um, the reason, again, it's because it's unlike comic books where comic books were, you know, you had a title, let's say Spider Man. So Amazing Spider Man, number one, two, three, four. And they just kept a regular sequence of publishing schedule. So monthly, right? And they kept numbering it at least until they stopped numbering them in the 90s. But, you know, for decades, they just kept numbering it that way. Now, the book publishers used numbering as well. Yeah. But they had their own sort of internal numbering system. So sometimes you'll look at some publishers and each publisher had different lines of books. And so they would number them differently. And sometimes the numbers don't seem to correspond to how you think they'll correspond. And because every book is a different title by, a, you know, most of the time, a different author, and it could be a different genre. There's no sequence. It's not like Spider-Man where you can follow the story and figure out even without the number, you can maybe look and carefully tell, okay, this issue looks like it comes before that one, right? It, it, it wasn't always clear with the, with the numbers, but there is a numbering system. Um, and if you get into this hobby, you can pretty much figure it out. And there's, there's, a, there's a web, another uh, website I should mention, bookscans.com, bookscans.com, um, where it's an effort to post as, as, as many of the covers from vintage paperbacks uh, the vintage paperbacks, although they've included even the 1970s. Typically, most people include 1940s to 60s. Uh, but this website, it's it just with, with the help of contributors, they keep sending in um, scans of covers. And it's an effort to try to get as many of them on there as possible. And, and they're listed by publisher. So you can see on that site how they list them by numbers. And, and, and figure out how they all work. But did you want to say something old to that or no? No, no, let's keep kicking through. But uh, right, cool. it's is very valuable. It's a, it's a great site. If, if, uh, Sounds good. Um, so let us start off the second half of the scans with this beauty. Again, you would say um, another of the exotics, right? Into that, uh, into that same sort of um, um, category. Yeah. Uh, but again, good girl art, exotic woman. Um, that's his third one that we know of uh, that he's done. Um, again, for popular libraries, so the same beautiful uh, colors, that same textural feel that he has um, for the skin um, and, and, and the same color palette, the same lighting techniques. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, and then you go from that and stay, staying with the same publisher. And the lighting is different here but you got the same similar type of textural technique, not only on the skin, um, but the dress, the clothing, the backgrounds, you know, um, just beautiful stuff. And I, I and that's of course another, uh, this is another uh, example of one that the uh, original art survived. So that's obviously the one on the left. Um, however, this one, unlike the others, this one, you can tell it's not as vibrant. Um, and that's simply because it, it you know, it, it accumulates grime over time and um and this probably i don't know for a fact but whoever owns this one probably has not taken it in for a cleaning um that's all this one could use is a nice cleaning that probably costs you a couple hundred bucks and 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 then maybe a revarnish and that would be it and this thing would look exactly like it was painted yesterday you know um so let's move on to another one this one i love because First of all, the setting is so different, right? You know, you know, how often have you seen a vintage paperback taking place on the docks near near the lake, right? Um, the composition is fantastic with that that diagonal, that diagonal composition, right? Going from the woman's gaze diagonally down over to the guy. Again, that that prototypical um, uh, uh, popular library era um, technique for the skin that he always did with that texture. And it's just instantly recognizable as his skin, you know, um, just beautiful, 
I love the, the, the characters, the way that they're behaving. It's just, you know, a good time out on the docks going, going to, to take a swim, what have you. Um, it's different on, a, on an overcast, maybe sunny, a bit sunny, but overcast day. The lighting's great. I just love it. It's very different from most covers, you know? Yeah, well, because most of his most of his popular libraries, especially the early ones, you think, hey, it, it, it's kind of a dark palette with these glowing characters coming up right out of out of the background. This one is just a very bright and and like you said, it's overcast, but it's a lot sunnier than a lot of his other covers. And of course the girl's hair is just like wild. It's that <laughs> Yeah, Marcus. Yeah, how does he get? How does she get that volume in her hair? I don't know, man. Uh, but, but CJ says she's a Brett girl. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> he answered it for you. All right. So here we go with another popular library. Again, similar color schemes and lighting. You know that that he uses to achieve that cool lighting technique. Um, with again, I, I I can even though even though she's not in a in a dress. Let's say you know it's not your typically sexy outfit. I still consider this kind of that it, it falls into that GGA, you know, good girl art uh, cover. Not quite as typical, obviously, because of what she's wearing. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's it's very low cut, you know, um, the way she's just so casually, you know, let me light your cigarette, big boy. <laughs> you yeah. Know? You, know, you know what? With Popular Library, he did so many covers. He did about 200 and they had a, a much um, wider range of authors that he painted there than at Avon. So it, it's it, his range of subject matter broadened like, you know, quite a bit. Um, so he got a chance to paint all different kinds of things, which is why I like showing um, a lot of popular libraries. Like Yeah, no, no, me too. Me too. Uh, excellent point, Mr. Regi. Excellent point. That's right. It was all about selling and you got to, you got to sell as many copies as you can. And, you know, they knew even back then sex sells, right? That goes, probably back to the end of time, right? Or the beginning of time. So, um, yeah. And um, David is saying it's page 13, good girl art. I'm not sure what page 13 refers to, David. Please uh, elaborate if you can. And the comic art Boston says, tastefully suggestive was the way to go then, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Although I'm sure, you know, I'm sure if you saw some of them in comic art Boston, You'd, you'd, you'd say, ooh, that's a little bit beyond ta uh, tasteful, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Marcus, if you're being facetious or not, or if you've actually read Emmy uh, Chaber, uh, which is, uh, of course, a pseudonym. Um, but uh, I'll take your word for that. If It's, it's got to be good. Oh, PG, oh, so David says PG-13 rating. Okay, <laughs> PG-13, yeah. good girl art. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And SLP Toy Avenue says, seeing some very famous authors here on these books. Oh, exactly. And not always, but absolutely there were. And um, and that's what we were saying earlier is that the the you know the paperback industry it brought not only it brought literature to the masses, but also all sorts of nonfiction, fiction, what have you, every anything you can imagine, they put it out there, you know. So, um, all right, let's pop up the next one. Another good girl piece with that sly guy. <laughs> love that look on his face. Yeah. Um, John, Johnson did that kind of look on a lot of guys. I mean, that was, you know, it's yeah. funny. We're showing maybe 50, you know, 50 to 70 covers. He painted like 500 of them. He, he did that kind of thing, these smirking guys, going all the way back to one of the first slides that we showed, right, that Argosy cover with those smirking sailors. It was just one of his things. Yeah, yeah. And this guy's we have to. I just want to. I got it. So, so Lowell, Lowell and I, Lowell and I love this because, well, I'll tell you why I love it. Look, I love the, the 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 whole motif of a painting inside of a painting. First of all, okay. Second of all, it's got that that texturized skin that I love. Um, although I will say, Lowell, and I don't know what, what you what you think about this. I do think he overdid the texture on the foreground girl. Um, she almost looks like a, a, a hairy beast in, in, in a sense, you <laughs> yeah, know, that could, that could be the scan though. I mean, I think, you know, again, yeah. these things it's got the way you it out on the actual paperback. Yeah. But, but yeah, so I love it because of the painting within the painting, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that the, the, the painting is slashed, that's her in the painting in the background, right? So who slashed it all? Um, the slashes look absolutely real. It looks like the canvas has been torn into. 
you know, almost like it's, it's, it's a photograph of a painting inside the painting, pasted into the painting. Uh, fantastic. And I love this because um, many years later, the aforementioned James Avati, another one of the top artists in this field, um, did this one, which is perhaps even better, uh, a painting inside of a painting, very, very famous. And the reason this one to me is, is potentially even better than the Raymond Johnson one is because of the extreme foreshortening on the painting in the painting. Um, to have to paint that painting at that angle, that extreme foreshortened angle, is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult and to, to, to get it to look right, right? Um, so yeah, just fabulous, fabulous, fabulous composition. Um, it's just stunning. And so, yeah, it, it, the, the Johnson one reminds me of it and yeah, they're both fabulous, but, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. You want anything you want to say about this one? Um, Lol? yeah, well, the other thing is very few, um, of these paperback artists attempted to do the painting within the painting. The other thing they would try that they would do some of these really good guys was they would do like a mirror shot where they painted somebody looking in a mirror. Johnson did that a bunch of times. But the other thing about this particular one that is great is because it's like a painting, he got away with having her completely nude in the slash painting, which is kind of like, hey, that, that's that's like an artist. He's like, well, you know, Renaissance paintings, right? Throughout history, nudes have been painted. You know, the statue of David, he's completely yeah. nude in, 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 in sculpture. It's kind of a thing. And I guess he figured he could get away with it because he yeah. was putting it on this painting that was in the background. But yeah. it's just interesting. But, you know, and, and NSN Art, um, and, and thank you for showing up, by the way. Thank you. Good to see you, man. Um, so he says, I don't think that's from the painting. And, and, and she slashed it out of jealousy. Here's the thing. Without reading the book, you don't really know. And I haven't read the book. And, and Lowell hasn't read the book. Um, I initially didn't think that it was her. But then I, when I was telling Lowell what I loved about it, he said to me, oh, yeah, the fact that, you know, she's there. she's, a, she's That's her in the painting. And, and so he convinced me it was her. The thing about it is, the reason I didn't think it was her initially is because, well, the one in the painting has more blondish hair. But then when Lowell said it's her, I thought, well, you know what? She may have kind of blondish hair, but in the foreground, because of the lighting, maybe it makes her more look brunettish. But now that NSN Art says it, I do kind of, I'm going, I'm sort of wavering back and saying that, that he may be right, that it may be somebody else and that she is slashing it out of jealousy. Hard to tell, but like I said, I, I, don't, I haven't read it. Yeah, hard to tell. I just assume too because it says portrait of Lisa, so you're thinking that's Lisa. I right, do have exactly. the. Book. I may have to look into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and but that's the thing. But but this is what I love about it, though, guys, is the fact that oftentimes, especially if, if you don't read the book, you know, it tells a story and it makes you wonder what's going on here, right? Yeah. It tells that the artwork tells a story. That's and that's that's absolutely what I. That's part of uh part of what I love about it. So. Um, Comic Car Boston says, so that's a good point, Lowell. I was thinking the same thing because at the time, anything of a conventional cast would not have passed muster. Right. Um, looks like the right hand is down, maybe holding a knife. All right. Look at the way it's down while her left is on her lap resting. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But the, again, well, we can assume. Right. Um, but that's what I love about it. Anyways, it tells a story. So um, here we got another one. This one of the uh, he didn't do too many of these, but he did some of these uh, detective hard hard boiled crime novels love the this one's for gold medal that he didn't do too many for um i love this one more a bit more on the realistic side um but it's got that usual nice texture but not quite the same it's 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 like halfway between his smoother technique and the the, the fully textured technique you know um nice lighting i love the the drama the suspense that it tells yeah just really cool and of course it's my favorite genre so that's why i like it you know um, yeah, those thuggish he, guys in the background. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The detectives and that guy, the, the, the thug hiding, right? Like, you know, you know he's he's the culprit of something. Here we go. The guy from Coney Island. And I'm Brooklyn. sure. There we yeah, go. Brooklyn. Lowell's a, a Brooklyn guy, guys. Uh, so uh, he can relate to this one. But I love this again about this for me is more about storytelling, right? The way he's just voila. Look what we have here, gentlemen. Step right up, step right up, right? carnival barker type um looking at the babe up on the the, the stage probably trying to sell sell them on all on, on i don't know you know give me 25 cents and i'll 
I'll give you a turn with her in the back. Who knows what the hell he's selling there? But uh, but it's fun, and it's got that great, great lighting, especially uh, coming from the background on the girl. It's fantastic. Here, the next one we have is I really love this one because we go back to Avon. And I just love the POV. I love the fact that you're up, basically up on a branch in the tree, right, on a different branch that the sniper's on. Um, just different. The fact that he's, you know, sniper, uh, trying to trying to shoot a, a, a soldier um, at a, um, a bit, I believe it's a, 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 yeah, an atomic energy plant. Um, yeah, and of course, it's got a typical uh, a red-headed uh, Johnson girl there who's been on many covers before. Yeah, yep. it's really, yep. really fun. Yeah, another one by Sterling Noel who did um, I Killed Stalin, and it's another kind of government espionage type thing that that uh, Sterling Noel did. But yeah, it's a great angle. Yeah, I mean, you don't again, you don't um, you don't you don't see that type of a you know you you you're you've seen sort of aerial type a angles or angles where the the um, the, um, the camera is behind the foreground guy right the four person in the in the foreground but uh you know up in a tree like that with a guy with a rifle sniping i mean yeah that's uh yeah it's 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 unique and Mackie poopoo um i do not know personally of any that he has done there is a gentleman uh by the name of rudy nappy who did um hardy boys or or certainly nancy drew covers and he was a, a well-known um uh, vintage paperback cover artist. But as far as I know, nothing by Raymond Johnson that I know of, uh, he, unless we discover something. Uh, he, he might he might have done one or two Nancy Drews. I have to look. But he did do a couple of the late Tom Swift uh, children's book series. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, he did four or five of them in the late okay. 60s. Okay, so uh, Stanley asks, do collectors focus on the art or are the book's contents and popular popularity important? Well, the way to answer that is that it is both, Stanley. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, so okay, so let me, let me get the, the comment off here. And um, even though I can't see you, Stanley, let me come, let me, let me come back to you. Um, so there, I guess you could say there's two different types of collectors for the most part in vintage paperbacks. You have the guys that collect the paperbacks for nothing other than the the cool artwork on them. I'm, I'm that kind of a guy, and, and Lowell is that kind of a guy, and there are many guys like that. But there are equally as many guys and gals who do collect it for the authors. They want the stories, and they like the covers. But they don't really care about, you know, who may have painted them. Sometimes if you try to help some of these people out and you tell them who painted the cover, they don't care. They're, oh, you know, okay, whatever. They they ignore you online, you know. <laughs> some people don't care. They just, they care about the reading and other guys care about the, the art. But other guys compare, uh, care about both. So I guess you say there's three different types of collectors. Yeah, I was going to say there's three because quite a few of the book aficionados I know really do care. And and look, I care. I have my favorite authors. I love Dave Keen. I love um, Cornell Woolrich, William Irish, um, Heinlein. I have my, my I have my cadre of um, things that I collect, but I also love the covers. But there's zillions of authors out there who nobody knows of today. And the only reason their books are collected is because of the cool artwork. Yeah. So that falls into that. Yeah, exactly. Now, let's right. kick so more up. Yeah, let's uh, fire up this uh, next one. Send them summer. Don't know what that means, but uh, another lovely lady. This one at least covered up uh, a rare one where there, you know, you don't see any skin other than oh, I guess he, uh, in those days, um, showing you know leg above the knee that was still kind of risque, right? Yeah. In the in the nineteen fifties, nineteen fifty four. So um, lovely legs, you know, nice toned calves. Um, you know, quite realistic. Love the lighting as usual. It's got your typical all the hallmarks of of. Raymond Johnson's technique, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's that lighting, that glow, you know, that's, uh, it, it's a common scene. It's just a, 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 an average scene in a bar, right? Yeah. He brings it to life. It's, 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 it's yeah. hard. And here we have next a, a quite a different one. And you can say a little bit about this one because I know how much you love this one, Lowell. Yeah. I like this one just because it's kind of heroic. He only did four or five um, for Lion. And I think most of them were this Lion library. Um, and it's just, you know, that Zeus 
with the lightning coming out of his fingers, it's almost like something out of a comic, right? I don't think maybe comic guys would like this. Um, yeah. When I saw this, you know, a lot of things I saw just on book scans because you and I both ran through book scans looking for Johnson covers. And I was like, wow, you know, that looks like Johnson. And then you focus in on the girl on the left and it's like 100% that that's a Johnson girl. No, absolutely. I, just, I like the heroic aspect of it. Yeah, I know. And to me, to me, it all looks like Johnson immediately. All of it. Uh, it's, I don't need to just zero in on the girls. So for me, that was an obvious one, you know. Um, so here, similar to that one I loved before, the, the beautiful composition, the painting that uh, Brian owns. Similar, right? With like the, the, in terms of the scene, you know, five, six, in this case, actually six characters, you know, teenagers probably or in their early 20s. Um, a floozy, I guess, what you would have called back in the day, right? <laughs> Yeah, you got my word right there. That's a classic floozy. Dress off the shoulder and, you know, the guy in the white shirt, he knows what he's got and he's grabbing onto the dress and you know what's you know what's going to be coming next, right? So it's really, really risque. Um, but yeah, it's really alive, right? Right, Like the, like the previous one, like all the characters having a great time. I mean, look at the dancing girl in the, the, the top left corner. Um, I love the guy at the bottom center, right? Just relaxed, having a chill cigarette, you know? Um, yeah, everybody's alive. Everybody's telling a story here, you know? Yeah, it's just really everyone's having a good time, you know? I really love that. And um, then he did a cover for Ace on an Ace Double. For those of you who don't know, Ace Double's a really, really, really popular uh, publisher because um, so this line of books, so you see here, Turn Left for Murder, and in the top left corner, just like the comic books, you could see it says D89. So that was the number for this book. It was D89. And there would have been a D88 before it and a D90 after it. Um, but when you take this book and you just flip it over to the other side, instead of a back cover, you would see another front cover. And it's because they would publish two books, what they called recto verso. So two books published back to back. But you just flip it over and suddenly, you know, you can start reading another brand new novel. Um, yeah, I love this one. It's a classic uh, uh, looking um, ace uh, detective, uh, hard-boiled type cover, uh, crime cover. Um, again, that he, he didn't do that many of. Um, and again, with, as usual, uh, a bad babe, the, the mall, you know, beautiful lighting techniques again. Um, this is, of course, on the left, uh, the original painting. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the greatest picture. It's the best I could jig it up in, in, in Photoshop. Um, it's not a scan. It's a, it's a, it's a photo. Um, so, so the lighting is a bit bright on it. So it, it, it's, it's probably more accurate to look at the, the paperback in this instance, but, um, really, really nice. A nice example of, um, of his hard boiled crime stuff. And this next one, uh, guys is, is really cool for those of you who know this lovely actress who I love, I've always loved her. And she's still with us, and I'm so happy. Rita Moreno. Um, yeah, fantastic. It's just a, a really cool cover, uh, a, a good girl art example. Um, really cool to find that um, he used Rita Moreno from the cover of Life magazine, uh, issue uh, from March 1st, 1954, um, as photo reference. But as you can see, what's really cool about it is that he particularly used it Simply to get the look, right? The look of the face and how the mouth and the 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 the, the facial structure is when you, when you put your mouth in that position, the nose, the eyes. But he he carefully uh, made it, you know, made sure to change enough details so that the woman on the cover, you know, is not. So he's not using the likeness of Rita Moreno, and it's it's just another girl, and he just borrows her um, her expression essentially. Yeah, it's a nice look into into how a lot of these artists work. Um, I think Bruce Brenner turned me onto this um, that that he used this as a uh, as a reference. And Rick, you know, Rick, Rick, I didn't know you love. I didn't know you were into paper paperbacks, let alone that you loved Ace Doubles. Awesome. Good. good to know, man. Sorry to interrupt, Law. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, so in Mar in 1954, uh, Johnson was living in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right, it's not Model Central. So for any of these guys, you know, to save money, they would call, they call them tear sheets. They would use covers or they would tear sheets out from inside the magazines and they would use them just as references for their paintings. 
Yeah, so and CJ little, uh, techniques. CJ says, "Did you do the other cover?" I don't remember what what the book is on the other cover, but I would imagine not. For the most part, uh, most of the time, it was a completely different artist uh, on both sides. Yep, for the most part. Yep. Yeah. All right. So then we move over to here, and look, look at this one, guys. Check out. Look at the uh, look at the author. For those of you who are fans of the author, look who that is. It is indeed Ian Fleming, the guy who did James Bond. And yes, this is a James <laughs> Bond novel um, known to everybody as Casino Royale, um, but uh, changed for the novel here uh, for as you asked for it. Kind of silly, really. But um, well, it was an Americanization, you know, Ruben. Right. This was this this book is famous. It's it's famously rare, and, and of course collected because so many Ian Fleming. Collected. You're welcome. But he was he was furious, Fleming. This was his first novel in America. Popular Library changed the title, and we don't have the back, but on the back it shows they changed the name of James Bond to Jimmy Bond. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so, so they, they committed two sins for an author: changed the title and the name of his character to Americanize it. Um, they didn't think Americans would like know how to pronounce Casino Royale. <laughs> they thought Jimmy was hey Jimmy was what you call James in America right yeah so he was famously mad at them and 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 took the publishing rights away after this but it, it's really rare book especially yeah. with the orange cover it's printed really cheaply so they get rubbed yeah really tough um, but it's a great you know that orange coloring it's very unusual yeah and exactly. the characters just kind of come up out of the background um, it's it's simple but. You know, it's James Bond is like pouring his own liquor. Like, you know, you kind of, that, that's pretty American. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, let us move on to the next one. And guys, I think if we, if you, if you guys, thank you for being so patient, by the way. Um, um, I think if we really start speeding up, we could probably see the rest of it. If you, if you hang out another 20 minutes or so. Um, so hopefully you guys will stick around with us. I know a lot of guys have dropped out and I appreciate they sticking around for as long as they did. And thanks to the rest of you who, who continue to be here with us. Or really, we, we both really appreciate it. Um, okay. So let us move on to the next one and another famous, uh, this is a, this is a, not, not so much today, but a famous author, Jim Thompson back then in, in, in those, in that era, um, really highly collected, um, did a lot of, uh, he, for those of you, uh, may know Jim Thompson or of Jim Thompson because of a novel he wrote, his most famous novel, a novel called The Killer Inside Me, which was turned into a movie, oh, I'd say about a decade ago. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, it, it starred, I, I think, Casey Affleck was it? I think it was Ben Affleck's brother, if I'm not mistaken. I watched it. It was good. Uh, I don't remember if it was him or not, but... Um, but yeah, good author, well collected, like I said. Another sort of uh, good girl art, floozy. Don't know what it looks like. She's inviting him instead of him wanting to invite her somewhere. So she she is. I've read this book, so she she's inviting uh, she's inviting him into the car. He's yeah, Rick. Bad boy. <laughs> Jake, <it> was, <laughs> good, good. Hey, Robert. Good, good comments on the uh, on the Bond book. Uh, the price of first image Fleming Hounds are Exactly, exactly, absolutely. And uh, kind of Liz looking exactly. I agree. Not a not a banana in his pocket. Nice, Rick. Exactly. I didn't even notice that until you said that. That's funny. Um, all right. Yeah, the these, next these one. last two are, are pricey. That. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Money. Yeah. But just in case you guys want to know, in case you you ever get tempted, you want to sort of dig into the vintage paperback market. The vast majority of paperbacks in in decent condition can be had for like ten bucks or less. Um, but but there are some ex more expensive ones. Yeah, maybe. they've gone up. You'd be I, I I would raise that to twenty. But I would say between really? okay. yeah between twenty and fifty dollars. Most of, many of the of the classic books you can get a decent copy. Okay. But like you asked for it by Fleming, like oh, a nice yeah. copy of that goes for five six hundred bucks. Oh well, yeah, no, but that's that's Bond, right? So yeah, yeah. So you live once, beautiful, love it, love the girl. She looks almost photorealistic here. Uh, love the brute in the background. He makes again tells a story. You're wondering, did he hurt her or is he saving her? Right? Um, yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And, and, and you know, was a very collected author. And and without 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 blowing this one up, it, it it looks like hey, is that is that a photograph he sort of dropped in there somehow? You know, 
uh, with the monochromatic look to it. It's like, oh, but then you're like, mm, no, and you blow it up and you realize, no, it's a painting. You know, yeah, very nice. professional. And, and her, the gold in her skirt is just. Oh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely astonishing. Yeah, it's a great, great cover. It's a great example of, of good girl art for him. This is uh, totally in the opposite direction in terms of style, technique. Just uh, an, um, an example I wanted to show everyone uh, to show you, uh, you know, and just another uh, example of all the varied types of, of, of techniques and styles that he employed throughout his career. Um, and the fact that it's another sort of good girl art cover. Yeah, I call this the Mitchell Hook style because Mitch Hooks yeah. was, you know, he started out as kind of a realist and then he changed to this style where he did like a line drawing in the background with a painting like on top of it. So it's still obviously a Johnson girl, um, <laughs> but uh, done in this Mitchell Hooks type style that became yeah. very popular in the late 50s. Yep. Yeah. And all right, let's uh, see a few more here real quick. So this, uh, this everybody, just so you know, for those of you who are not into vintage paperback, the, this would fall under the category of what vintage paperback guys uh, refer to as JD. The letters JD, the initials stand for juvenile delinquent. So there was a whole series of, of stories and paperbacks um, around, you know, back in the 50s, uh, around, you know, usually gangs, gangs in New York, you know, uh, kids living in the slums, hanging out in the slums, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, this is a, a, a well-known JD book, um, with nice, nice, um, Johnson women up top, although not your typical New York scene on bottom, more like backwood backwoods boys at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, those JDs were in the backwoods too. So <laughs> they had them everywhere. <laughs> and, um, here we have a beautiful example again of, um, for everybody watching, this is where we once again he 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 he, sl he alters his his style slightly here, and um, he begins to sort of again smooth out not only the skin to some degree. You can still see texture, of course, but it's it's not as 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 thick, if you will. Um, same thing on the dress; it's a little more smoothed out. Um, but it's a nice example of, of good girl art for that he did for Berkeley. Yeah, in the late fifties, he 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 smoothed out a lot more stuff. Um, even for his pop and then in popular library, like we just saw with that other one um, that I call the hooks esque, he, he did a lot of other kind of uh, other kinds of experimenting. Right. And here we have look at this, guys. Does this sound familiar? Does that title sound familiar? It's the long pig again. <laughs> we started, the long pig again. started off with. But a, a complete, a complete, um, um, and just a coincidence. It, this, this is not the, uh, it's not the novelized version of that magazine uh, article. Yeah, completely yeah. different. Just but it is an original painting. But it's original art on the left hand side, exactly. And so that's another one. Nice to see that it survived. So very nice. I, I, for me, not one of his better examples. I mean, the top half is 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 great. Uh, the bottom half, you know, the montage, the small montage images, it's just. They're, you know, they're a little too small. There's not much happening there. Not enough to sort of put more detail, his typical that, that he would do, you know. Um, so, yeah, not not what I would call one of my favorite covers, if you would, you yeah. know. Well, they did this a lot in the late 50s, though, these montages. Yeah, the montages, exactly, exactly. All right, let's go back to another couple of uh, good girl art covers. Um, va Va Voom. And yeah, that's a beauty. I mean, um, not not your prototypical beauty in terms of the face, I, I will say, right? It's not your typical face. She looks maybe like she could be older, not the same. Yeah, she's growling the blues, though, into that mic, though. So she's, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's a little hard to tell. But obviously, she's vivacious. And all these yeah. guys in the back are, are listening to her sing. And um, those hands, those hands, gentlemen, those hands. Love it. it. Tells a story again. You know, it's exciting. And from there we go to this one. Love the composition on this one. Yes, it's 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 good girl art. It's it's titillation. Um, but just look at the horizon. It goes from breast across to the leering guy's face, across his face to the breast again. I mean, it's it's perfectly centered uh, composition. You you got to give him that. Um, yeah, they, they, I, would have I would think that, that uh, quite, a, quite a few uh, guys would have picked up this off the shelves when they saw it. Yeah, well, you know, it's similar like to those other ones. It's, it's only four of them, but it's like a nice party, and they're having a good time. And, uh, you know, he, he did quite a few of these um, party scenes. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. He he loves that uh, he loves that party scene thing, you know. Yeah, well, it was right. the book. I'm sure you know it, it's it really. If the book was given to him, hey, this is the book with the party scene. <laughs> yep, there you go. All right, so this one, guys, is another uh, JD juvenile del delinquent. Um, and uh, Lowell, tell me uh, what you know about the, who the model may have been based after. Uh... Yeah, so this is most likely based on Diana Doors, who was a famous um, Hollywood uh, comet, I'll call her, you know, shooting yeah. star. She yeah. had a, you know, a, a brief moment of fame and got into drugs and, 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 and alcohol and right. kind of ruined her career. But she has a very distinctive face and, and lips. Um, but yeah. this, this is a monarch. So, you know, this Jailbait Street, I, I would, this is another one I'd call a fridge magnet because among JD collectors, like this yeah. is one that everybody's got to have. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. title, uh, the classic, the greasers with the grease backed hair. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, he started with Monarch right around the time he moved to New York. Um, so this is uh, uh, his first one for Monarch was 1958. Yeah, CJ, straight cats. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's that, it's that, that kind of pompadour, slick back look. Get their um, dinner from a garbage can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're in an alley, you see, with the bricks. <laughs> um, he painted great bricks. So you'll see it on, on a later Monarch. Um, but with Monarch, you know, he smoothed out the, the paint a bit um, for most of these. But this was like his third gig, I'd say, after Avon, then Popular Library, and then Monarch. He painted probably about 30 covers for Monarch. Um, and this kind of starting to move to the end of his career. Very nice. Very nice. And from there, it takes us to another JD. Um, though not, you know, when you, it's funny because I think, is this officially a JD or no? Yeah, well, it's the tough ones. I mean, it's tough kids. Yeah. Life on the streets. That's that's it's young kids. They're on motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you know, you know what it is though. Like, if anybody's familiar, or I, I don't know in the United States if this was popular, but like growing up when we get into junior high, uh, in my day, um, we were all forced to read S. E. Hinton books. So the most famously known for the Outsiders. Um, that was then. This is now. Rumblefish. Um, anyways, I, we we all had to read that stuff, and um, it was it was like a tale of morality, um, and it was about 1950s greasers, but not in New York. More like I think it was a uh, Kansas. I want to say, kind of an odd place to be. But um, the thing was, is that the story was about the greasers and the socias. So the social, the the rich, so the the rich kids wearing the polo shirts on the rich side of town. Right versus the poor kids on the wrong side of town who were obviously the leather jackets and all that stuff, you know. And so this cover reminds me more of not obviously not the greasers, but the other kids, the socias, the socialites, right? Because they got better clothing. And so that's why they don't remind me of juvenile delinquents, you know, and that's why it throws me off as a JD cover. Well, yeah, he painted them a little bit happy faced, I'd call it, but but it's uh and, and look, it could be one or the other, you know, but it's definitely uh the book itself falls into that JD category. Yeah. And, and it's an art says if they have a motorcycle, they are a delinquent. Hey, <laughs> hey, 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 I used to ride motorcycles. I was never a delinquent. <laughs> exactly. Kansas greasers, apparently. I may be wrong, but it's somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere like somewhere in, in, in you know, that part of America where it's kind of like cornfields and such. Um, but I think it was Kansas. Um and okay, CJ says definitely. Okay, we'll go with J, uh, um, JD, man. We'll go with JD. All right, we got to keep it moving. So let us go to the next one. Oh, I love this one. Jack the Ripper. Just because it's a famous story. I've always been in, 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 enthralled by the original story ever since childhood. And it's a sexy version of, you know, scene out of the, the, the yeah, that, that real life story. You yeah, know? look at those bricks. Yeah, I mean, those bricks are fantastic. Big bricks, right? No one's bricks, right? They're all comic art guys love bricks, apparently. <laughs> but yeah, it's a great painting. Just uh, that rear view, and she's in horror, and, but still managing to pull her skirt down. But it's I'm you know pulling it from the middle, but like it's ripped. It's like he's coming after her. Yeah, uh, oh, it's beautiful. I classic. Know, this is classic for horror fans. So. Yeah, love it. Um, okay, so you're gonna want to say something about this one and. Just so you guys know, there's roughly 10 more to go. So just stick with us. Here we go. 
Yeah, so this is Cardinal, which you know had a lot more historical and and uh, Cardinal is a publisher, just FYI, everyone. Yeah, well, it was, I think it was a division of pocketbooks, but it was like right. they're kind of more uh, stead um, historical type fiction and adventure fiction. And he did a bunch for them. <laughs> and a lot of them are cool like this. What I love about it, of course, besides for, you know, the girl with the elegant dress and that back shot, he did a lot of covers with the back shot like that. But look at that mirror, yeah. that federal mirror. That's so like ornate. So ornate. It's furniture. Yeah. You know, and, and oh, using yeah. that as a device to, to have the text inside of it, but this masterfully painted eagle, and that's that's like what would have been in a in an American home in the 1800s if you had a lot of money. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, SLP Toy Avenue says, "Hey, I'm in Kansas." So, <laughs> so, um, guys, I mean, I guess the answer is no. None of you have heard of S, as in Steve. It was S E. The initials S E Hinton, and nobody's heard of the out. It was a movie, by the way, uh, The Outsiders in the early '80s, with with all those famous um, uh, uh, young Hollywood guys, I and mean, even Tom Cruise, although he he had a small role in it. Ralph Macchio, uh, the guy from uh, the Patrick Swayze, Matt Dillon. Anybody? Nobody's familiar with the outside. Yeah, I'm, old, I'm older than you. I remember American Graffiti, The Lord's. Yeah, but, I, but I know American <laughs> Graffiti too. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I mean, yeah, I don't know. they forced us to read it. What can I say? Um, and and, 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 <laughs> and the books, the, uh, the S.E. Hinton books were famous because it was always about these juvenile delinquents um, from the you know the, the rough side of the tracks, you know, and. Um, she wrote the first novel, The Outsiders, when she was like 17. That's kind of what made it more famous, you know? And then it became, um, yeah, CJ says, definitely remember The Outsiders. Okay, okay. And there you go. Look at that. Du hey, what's up, Dwayne's a pain? Stay gold, pony boy, stay gold. Yeah, that's a classic line from the from the book, you know? Um, awesome, awesome. Uh, and, Rumble, and Rumblefish. And that was then, this is now, and, and all the others. All right, all right. I uh, appreciate it. But just wanted to know if it was set in Kansas. I just can't remember what, what state it was in. I think it was. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. It's this strange, bizarre one <laughs> with the gorilla from Conga. Very famous, though. Very I mean, famous. Among, among uh, sci-fi and uh, horror movie-type collectors, um, Conga's a classic. <laughs> so it does have a it's kind of a goofy gorilla, but, you know... Um, uh, very yeah. much a, a, a Johnson girl, but very, this one's very smoothly painted. Yes, exactly. This is where he gets to really into the blending of the paints and yeah, look at this, the skin and, and the, the, the dress and the guy's shirt. It's all smoothed out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Dwayne Tapain, are you absolutely sure? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. They, they have the house as a museum. Oh, excellent. Excellent. That's, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Gorilla Cell, last 60s DC. Absolutely, yeah. DJ. Yeah. Yeah. And Jeff, thank you for uh, confirming as well. Thank you, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. So the next one, I just want to put it out there. I used to own this. Um, yeah, got rid of it because it was not one of my favorite Johnsons. For me, it was a placeholder. Um, and yeah, and so I just decided to ultimately get rid of it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a classic, classic clinch pose. Every one of these artists. You know, a guy who did 550 paintings, he probably did 30 paintings that have this kind of clinch. And it was considered like a classic romance pose that every one of these artists had to know how to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And from there, let us go to another piece of good girl art. Beautiful. The Sex Pulse. <laughs> yeah. So Beacon and Monarch were both kind of, you know, they were, they didn't have like a lot of, of big name authors, but they broke a bunch of authors under pseudonyms who later became um, more famous writers. But they both used a lot of these good girl artists who painted great covers for them. And a lot of them are collected just for cover art. Um, yeah. Another one of the back shots, you know, once you want to a lot of back shots. I know you like the guy who painted. All right, guys. Thanks for uh, sticking around. Only seven more to go. And then I do my usual end of. Uh, End of episode thank yous and promos. But the seven more to go. Let's check this one out. And there's the bullfighting motif again that we saw at the beginning from his men's magazine era. Yeah, and we just found this one. I mean, I, I had no idea it existed. 
except it popped up on eBay and I recognized it immediately, the girl's face and then that bull. I was like, that's the same bull that he painted 10 years before and very yeah. much in the same style. Yeah. Yeah. And from there we go to another one where he went to gold medal, gold medal books, very popular and collected uh, vintage paperbacks. Um, he didn't do many for a gold medal though. And be I guess because he did, you know, he's going to another publisher. He figured, you know what? I'm I'm like 11 years or 13 years into my career, or into my paperbacks career. I'll I'll do something different again with another different style, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. or you know, he could have been told by the art director, "Hey, do yeah, something. he may have been asked to do something a la McGinnis kind of sort of thing." You know, who knows? With the yeah. long legs, it's right? the long legs. Yeah, it's very um, very elegant, and and it's just kind of something that a lot of the early 60s, late 50s kind of went towards this style with the big font um, and and a simpler picture. Yeah. But still beautifully painted. I mean, yeah. she's, she's a model, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And what about this one, Harem Island? I really, yeah. you know, I always hated this just because of the guy in the bottom. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a crazy preacher, but, you know, this is a, this is famously rare. Um, it's, it's pretty expensive to get a copy of it. Um, but it's 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 another one of those that back shot um, of you know showing showing that that full back and that elegant hairdo. He did at least five or six covers that that um, showed like the back shot with this kind of um, face and the hairdo. Right. Very very, very elegant though. And, and here and, we have another monarch book. Oh, this is the one with the paint damage too. Yeah, yeah. So it's got paint damage, as you can see, uh, missing paint there on the dress. So um, Comic Art Boston, um, whether you're still here or watching this later on, Rewind, um, that's a good example of what we were talking about earlier, you know, um, when I was saying how some of these things, they just weren't well taken care of. So they survived, uh, but oftentimes with a lot of paint damage. And so a piece like that, what you see on the side where the dress has a lot of pieces missing on it, uh, uh, paint chips, um, it's it's down to the collector, whoever owns it, right? If they want to get it restored and get people do, to do some infill painting, you can do it. And it's it's accepted. Um, but typically because the art, the art usually isn't worth enough, most, most collectors just won't bother. You know, they're happy enough to know that it survived and they'll just leave it as is, you know? Um, but yeah, that's a good example of that. Um, more of a jazz vibe. I guess that was the previous one. Stanley says, were there many superhero or fantasy paperbacks? Fantasy, I guess you could say there was a lot that, that was a common, uh, one of the common genres, fantasy genre in paperbacks, yes. Um, but superhero, no, there was only two or three that I can remember. Um, and and as as Marcus will attest, uh, one of them was a Captain America novel. He, he remembers very, very clearly from 1968, uh, which I have prints of and which I used as a backdrop on my very first uh, 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 episode of my relaunched YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, two or three. One of, one of them is a, a Robert McGinnis Avengers cover, believe it or not. Um, not a great effort by him, of course, but uh, um, still pretty cool that is a Robert McGinnis. Um, hey, Bob, yeah. good to see you. Wicked Wanda. Who, this <laughs> one? Oh, her wicked ways. Yeah, exactly. A bit, yeah, a little bit. Hey, Ruben, and, I just, I mean, there were a lot of superhero paperbacks, but they were later in the 60s and 70s. They, they re, you know, Marvel and DC put out tons of them, but they're not like what we'd really call vintage there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there you are, Comic Art Boston. Yeah, probably wouldn't do any restaurant. Yeah, exactly. And believe me, this painting isn't worth worth enough to, to really get that kind of work done. But again, I commend people that do go out and do it. Because it is, you know, pricey to do it. And uh, if you're doing it basically because you're, you're happy to, um, you know, just to know that you're doing your part and in, in, in keeping this painting alive for future, further generations, then that's that's great. I commend them, you know. Um, and exactly, exactly. Pen and ink, comic art represents much fewer complications, typically. Although not always. Sometimes there's very complicated jobs there, too. Um, all right. So let us go on to the next one. What do you say about this, Lowell? Bad girls. Bad girls. Bad this is girls, JD for girls. sure, right? I mean, <laughs> these girls are bad. They're badass. I mean, they've broken the legs off of this chair, and they're they're going to beat you with it. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I know you've commented in our discussions before, hey, you know, like they're not the prettiest girls. These girls no. are tough. They're <laughs> reform school and they want to get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. I love that. And I love that. I love that grinning, winking look of the blonde in the background, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We're here. We're bad. Yeah. I mean, this is famous. This, this, you know, anytime a copy of this comes up on eBay, it gets snapped up. I mean, J JD collectors love this one. Patty go junction gone bad. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A couple more guys. Tell me about this one more. Yeah. So this one, I just really like the composition, you know, almost all of the monarchs, very few of them fill the cover with paint. Just the way that he, he composed that kind of wisp going up, you know, and you've got the oil rigs and you've got the, the guy, you know, smirking, He's, he's a powerful guy. He's a woman breaker, right? He's like okay. a man's man. And then you've got the elegant girl with the back shot again um, up on the right side. And it's just, it's well composed. Yeah. And, and Comic Art Boston says 60 years old. Yes. But if you have, if, 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 if I guess you might not have noticed, uh, Comic Art Boston, that we've been going in order of publication, a year of publication. So, so the earlier ones were what was our earliest our our earliest paperback cover Lola was that that forty eight or forty six uh, forty eight was forty eight uh, yeah forty eight so think about that uh, so now you're talking seventy what uh, seventy four years, years old yeah exactly so yeah the coming up pop art yeah. yeah so all right cool and now we're gonna go to our last one here and this one jumps up to the mid sixties. And is an example of what uh, some people know because I have a, a bunch of these original paintings in my and I have them uh, on comic art fans. A gothic cover, a very, very rare gothic cover by Raymond Johnson, and of course, in slightly different style again to suit the style of the era that were, was being done on gothics. Um, with a just a, 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 a an amazingly beautiful candelabra, if you can even. Is, it, is that even called a candelabra when it's that ornate and gigantic? I mean, yeah, I think it is. It's yeah, it's gothic for sure. It's definitely gothic, but wow. And and of course, we recognize, you know, the 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 face as as um you know the puffy cheeks, the the round, the more rounded look of the the the, the facial structure, and 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 how that's how we notice that uh, uh, more than anything, it's that that gave it away as a Johnson cover. But this one is signed as well. So it confirmed it for us because thankfully the signature is there, you know. Um, and look at the hands, guys. Look at the hands. That's Come what on. I was waiting for, Ruben. I was waiting for you to talk about the hands. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at the hands, especially the one across the chest. Oh, look at the fingers. I mean, it's so natural. So, so beautiful. I mean, oh, come on. Come on. That's that's uh, no, that's definitely not Winona Ryder. <laughs> But yeah, you can <laughs> you can <laughs> fantasize, I suppose. Uh, you know, whatever floats your boat, I guess. You know, um, and uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Jeff says eyebrows. Look at the eyebrows. Exactly. Very, I mean, that's another yeah. Johnson, uh, yeah. Johnson trademark. Is this another little trademark of his? Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, CJ says those those Marlboro ads on calf. Did he do many others? We don't really know. Um, we just don't know. Well, he's, you know, yeah, he, we, we he did, a bunch, he's done he did a bunch of advertising art. We, we know of maybe 10 pieces or, or, or so, but those are the only original advertising art that, that, that I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Her belt is tight. Yeah. He's got to cinch it at the waist, you know? Oh yeah. Tiny waist. This is the sixties. This is the starting of the, the waif movement. So, guys, thank you so much. Uh, that was the last uh, um, um, paperback cover. Thank you guys for, for sticking around this long. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, just let me quickly remind you that uh, this was more of a show than a tell and that Lowell's, all his exhaustive research that he's done to dig up um, on Raymond Johnson, it's all packed into the 77th issue of this, this issue. That's the cover issue right there of Illustration Magazine, which just came out. Um, and like he said, you can buy a digital copy for around five bucks. Uh, the physicals, I believe, are around 15. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's uh, a little, uh, how many um, pages for the whole? It's, it's By the way, it's fully illustrated, tons of paperback covers in there as well. Uh, like how many pages is the whole thing? Color. Yeah, full color, yeah. Um, it's an 80-page issue, but this article is like 45 or 
it, it's it's most of the issue. It's uh, yeah. it's the main feature, and I really main feature, appreciate yeah. Dan giving it the cover and giving it the treatment. Dan did a phenomenal job laying it out. There's lots of full page um, illustrations of those covers in there, and it really is coffee table quality book. So you know. Support Dan's efforts at illustration there. Yeah, he does a fantastic job with that magazine. He always has. And um, you would imagine it's a very long article. Well, like you said, uh, it's about 40 some odd pages. Of course, that includes all the images, right? So right. Yeah, about yeah. 75 images, many that you didn't see here. We tried to show quite a few that weren't in there. Yeah, exactly. That's why we had, uh, you, we've shown you guys uh, just the paperbacks alone. I believe I showed uh, 76 paperbacks. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, excellent. Glad to see you getting a copy. Thank you. Um, yes, a labor of love. That's exactly what it is. Nobody paid him. He's not getting paid for the article. He's not getting paid to do this with me. Um, I'm not getting paid by anybody to do this. I mean, we do it because we love it and, and that's what it's all about, right? Furthering appreciation for this hobby. Um, you know, so thank you, Marcus, as always. Um, and thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. And he thanks you, Lowell, of course. Um, and um, I hope you do read it. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Rick. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, have a talk. A painter. <laughs> and thank you, Comic Art Boston. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for showing up. And uh, Brian, thanks. Peace, baby. Peace. That's awesome. Um, AJ, same thing. Thank you to you for showing up. Your first time here, so thank you. Really appreciate that. Thanks, SLP, Alan. Thank you to you as well. So, um, yeah, really, thanks so much, man. Uh, <laughs> long pigs for all. <laughs> thank you. Thank I you. Really, really, about appreciate long pig. <laughs> really, really appreciate it. Um, real quick, uh, for anybody still interested who's still here, um, actually, the viewers have gone up by like three or four since I started this little speech of mine. Uh, uh, I just wanted you guys to know there have been a lot of books, labor, and yes, Labors of Love on vintage paperbacks and vintage paperback collecting. I just want to show you these two that are the two most recent that I've gotten. Um, on the left, you have The Art of Pulp Fiction. It's kind of a misnomer. Um, it's, it's done by IDW, so you comic guys know, obviously, who IDW is. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer. They, they, they put that Pulp Fiction because the, the term Pulp Fiction sells. Um, but the, the subtitle is an illustrated history of vintage paperbacks. And it's probably got somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, somewhere in between 400 and 500 uh, full color paperbacks in there. Um, most of them, whenever possible, they're credited to the, to the, to the, um, to the artist. Um, I, I helped uh, Ed Hulse. It's, it's written and put together by Ed Hulse. Um, I gave him a hand in, in trying to, trying to give him as many artist credits as I could for anything that he didn't have credits for. Uh, but he did a phenomenal job. It's like I said, fully illustrated, full color, beautiful, beautiful coffee table type book. Um, so, so check that out. It's still available. And these things, you can't wait too long because these things, because they're labor, labor of loves, um, they don't, they don't print them in huge quantities, right? They typically tend to be 500, a thousand copies, you know, maybe 1500. And, and when they go out of print, they, they often don't get reprinted. Um, so if you want to get a copy, you should look, you know, look them up, whether it's on Amazon or, or where, wherever you get your, your, you know, finer books, um, get your copies before they sell out. Um, and on the right, yeah, it's, it's a book about Steve Holland. For those of you who don't know, a lot of the vintage paperbacks, thousands, literally thousands of vintage paperbacks, the male models that you will see on them are modeled, the male characters, I should say, are modeled by Steve Holland. And that's the model who you see there. Um, He's literally the only male model anybody in this hobby knows the name of. Um, he's that famous. He also modeled in the in the early '50s for comic book covers, um, and yeah, and and so as you see uh, by the the subtitle of the book, it's the world's greatest illustration art model. And this book is fantastic because what Michael Stratford, the author, what he's done here, he shows you the 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 published version of of the paperback, for example. And then next to it, he'll show you photos or photo stills um, or negatives of the photo shoot from which the cover was shot from um, that the artists, you know, use the photo, the photo reference that the artists uh, uh, used in order to complete the paintings. Um, 
So it's 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 just it's really insightful and really 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 fascinating. Uh, so another great book. Both of them that I picked up, uh, they came out. Both came out, I believe, what, 2021 for the for the Art of Pulp Fiction by Ed Hulse. Um, I think uh, Michael Stratford's book was early 2022, but like I said, they're both still available. Um, really quick. Also for you comic guys, especially, just want to show this real quick. Uh, just a segue. Uh, next week is my uh, comic art show and sell number five. That's the uh, 1970s to present show. As you can see, I filled out the, the rest of the artist names. Um, so take a look at that. I'll be sending out a, an email. So if you're, if you're on my um, mailing list, um, I'll be sending out an, an email to let you know about this uh, again this, this coming week. Um, but there you go. It'll be, it'll be fun. It'll be another art drop. And you know, you know, you know, these art drops, uh, uh, live streamed, uh, on YouTube are, are always fun. So, um, hopefully as many of you guys, uh, um, who, who, who've been watching my channel will, will, will show up for that next week. Um, and beyond that, take a look at this again. You got a glimpse of her, um, early in the show and, um, she says it all for me. So, um, I'm not going to beg. I'll, I'll let her do the begging. And, um, um, I did also want to say, um, real quick, let me pop in here. Shout out to my newest subs, Jonathan O and Michael Patrick Sullivan. Thank you guys. Um, I got more sub, uh, subscribers this week than these two gentlemen. Um, but again, for privacy reasons, because of how, how they have privacy, uh, the privacy, uh, settings set, um, I, I can't see those names, so I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't know who you guys are, but I appreciate you for subscribing. So thank you very much. Um, but to, 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 to these two guys, um, thank you as well. Um, you're the only two guys whose names I could see this week. Um, so thank you. Um, and what is Jeff saying? I'm popping back into the chat guys. Maybe time to pull, pull long big sandwich. Uh, <laughs> class was in session. Uh, okay. Another thank you to Lowell Fabio. That was on a previous cover, I guess. Uh, fantastic present. Yeah, thank you so much. And of course, she would say that. <laughs> uh, she, thank you, Jeff. Critical, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jeff. And 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 I, I I love this stuff. So I plan, I do plan um, to to do more vintage paperback related stuff. Um, you know, it, 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 I don't know when at this point. Um, but I do plan to do more. I My favorite genre that I've mentioned earlier is the hard-boiled crime genre. I'd love to do maybe a show just on hard-boiled crime covers, femme fatales, but of course, a mix of all artists from the vintage paperback era. Women uh, with guns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Deadly women with guns. And uh, uh, um, I also want to do more artist-focused shows with my more of my favorite artists, like uh, um, guys that I've worked on checklists for. Uh, uh, Robert McGuire. I, I want to do a Robert McGuire one for sure. A Charles Binger, uh, maybe George James Marchetti, the tons of guys. So I definitely want to do more shows like this and hopefully on some of them, I'll get Lowell to come on with me and be my, my presenter or my co-host, you know? Um, yeah. So, so that's it. Um, I'm on 278. Thank you. So I got two more I, that I didn't know about. I appreciate it. Um, very soon, very soon. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Comic Girl Boston. Uh, great growth. I appreciate it, CJ. Thank you so much. And nice vendors, Lowell. Of course, somebody had to mention it for sure. Vendors rock, baby. <laughs> and um, uh, what else is there? No, I think that's it, guys. So thank you again, and and, and especially to the 27 of, you who, 27 of you who have been consistent and have stayed throughout. Um, like I said, yeah, thanks very, very much. Um, that's it for us for today. Catch us next week. But um, if you're on my mailing list or if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Hit the notification bell so that you're notified when other types of content like this are scheduled um, onto my channel. All right. Uh, anything else you want to say, um, Lowell, for your, on your part? No, I just want to thank everybody who uh, tuned in for tuning in and anybody who's going to watch it on Rewind. Um, I hope you had a good Yes. Great thank you to the Rewind watchers again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hope it. you learned a lot and uh, hopefully we can do it again. Cool. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, everybody. And um, again, see you guys next week, those of you who are into the uh, comic art sale. And uh, I'll see you guys then. All right. Peace. Peace out.